Well, good evening. Good evening to all of you. Yes, I'm a little bit late. I promise that patience will uh, will pay off on this one because there was a little bit of things that I was editing in the background that, well, here's the thing. You guys can let me know when Recovery Addict shows up in the stream. He's doing his own podcast right now, but let me know when he shows up. When he shows up in chat, let me know. All right, so good evening to all of you catching us live. And to those of you on the replay crew, whom we love, we love the replay crew. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. I hope you are having a wonderful, wonderful day. So before we get rolling into what we're discussing today, for those of you who caught me yesterday, I was caught a little bit off guard, and I wanted to share something kind of at the outset um, before we even talk about the subject matter of what we're discussing. There was a little silver-haired gentleman that showed up on screen yesterday, and that was Ian Runkle. Ian Runkle is a good friend of mine. He's a Canadian firearms attorney and uh, criminal defense attorney. And uh, Kate R., nerdy nerdy writer cat, who uh, is kind enough to do timestamps for these videos, uh, posted this video because there was something that was interesting about when he showed up for the 200K. A lot of you guys are new to the channel. You guys might not have recognized that silver-haired gentleman, the elven legend of uh, Ian Runkle. So Mr. Runkle and Runkle of the Bailey is his channel. Back when the Depp v. Heard trial was going on, he came and stayed at Casa de Law and Lumber. I, I kind of opened the door. It was my first start into YouTube. Um, and I said, sure, why not come down and stay? Well, he stayed. And during his coverage, he was spending day and night. He slept overnight in that line to make sure he was in the trial. Um, one of the days when I was at work, uh, he hit 100,000 subscribers when he was in court. So on his way back, I put up a bunch of signs on the on the door before he came in, congratulating him on hitting 100,000 subscribers. And then he hit 200,000 subscribers when he had returned to my house, um, actually. And he was on a live stream doing catch-up stream. After he was back in Canada, he had 200,000 subscribers. And while I was catching up with him, I held up my notepad and said, congrats on 200K. So Ian is a, a good enough friend of mine that he has administrative privileges to my stream yard which means he can jump in kind of whenever and last night when he saw that i hit 200,000 subscribers he did just that and what did he do he held up a little paper sign just like i did 200k so that was really 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 i was caught off guard last night and uh Kate, thank you for grabbing that and these images because they they mean a heck of a lot to me. Um, and all of you guys that have been following along, you all mean a heck of a lot to me. So, um, and Kurt, I see in the chat, I didn't give you admin privileges. We all know why. We all know why. <laughs> Kurt jumping in and singing in the middle of uh, content would be interesting, wouldn't it? So... What are we doing tonight? So we're we're continuing our coverage and breakdown of the Maya Kowalski case, the Take Care of Maya case. So Maya Kowalski, um, in this particular case, it's Jack Kowalski, et cetera, at Al, which is uh, Jack Kowalski, Maya Kowalski, Kyle Kowalski, and the estate of Beata Kowalski versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. This case was documented in the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. Rather, the facts surrounding this case were documented with a bit of an angle in that particular case. So this is a case where Maya Kowalski, age 10 at the time, she presented to Johns Hopkins All Children's Health, J. Hatch for short. She presented to J. Hatch on October 7th of 2016, experiencing acute abdominal pain. She had a prior diagnosis of CRPS. And during her stay at the hospital, there was an intervention by uh, certain members of the child protection team and certain hospital staff. That intervention a few days later resulted in a shelter order that was put in place. There were different things that occurred during the course of the treatment and care while she was there sheltered for 87 days that formed the, the foundation of this particular lawsuit, which is seeking $220 million from the hospital for things that they allege occurred during the course of that treatment and care. This case has a tragic ending in that Maya Kowalski presented to the uh, juvenile or the dependency court on January 6th was denied contact with her mother. Her mother had requested to see her, was not allowed that that privilege. And on January 7th, Beata Kowalski unfortunately took her own life. 
So because this case involves very, very sensitive subject matter involving allegations of medical child abuse, treatments and therapies of various medicines that are controversial, and any number of situations that are, well, sensitive for parents of children, for medical providers, et cetera. I have a running banner that is uh, that gets run while I'm doing these streams just so that when people pop in, they're not surprised by what they see on the screen. Now, why am I talking to you guys? Why are we listening to this person on the screen? Hi, my name is Rob. This is my channel, Law & Lumber. I am a domestic relations litigation attorney. That means I am a trial attorney practicing in the area of family law in Northern Virginia. Not Florida, Northern Virginia. But this case has a remarkable intersection with the area of family law, an area that I know very well, having been practicing for more than a decade. I like the term practicing because you never really master it. You're always practicing it. But so I, I like to cover this trial and give an understanding of what we're seeing take place through, well, throughout the proceedings on the screen into the courtroom. And the past two days, I've been having, well, let me, let, me, let me tell you this. Ever since last Friday, last Friday, we heard the two attorneys, Mr. Shapiro uh, for the defense, Johns Hopkins, all children's, and Mr. Whitney for the plaintiffs. And they both got into a back and forth with the judge about what this case is actually about. And it resulted in a back and forth over whether Munchausen's by proxy and a diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy was a claim for which the plaintiffs were seeking relief. Because that seemed to be the foundation of a lot of what the hospital was, was presenting in the way of evidence. And at that point in time, I was wondering the same thing. What are we arguing about? I was very confused. And that confusion kind of remained because, well, yeah. Let me do this. I pulled up a bit of Mr. Hunter's opening statement. And I want to play it. I want to play it. Oh, I just did the repeat thing. People, ever, ever since someone pointed out that I repeat myself, I can always hear myself do it. I'm going to play a bit of Mr. Hunter's opening statement before we get into the coverage today. And I'll explain why I'm pulling it up as soon as we kind of listen to him talking. Okay. They're going to talk to you about whether or not the overarching allegation against all children's and its physicians, including even Sally Smith, that they were negligent in Maya Kowalski's care, and that their negligence somehow caused injury. We're going to suggest to you that, first of all, there was no ultimate injury caused, given the condition that she was given to us in. But more importantly, there was no deviation from the standard of care. You're going to hear from different doctors in different specialties that the care that was taken in diagnosing and treating Maya Kowalski, you're going to hear about teams of consultants. You're going to hear about meticulous investigations. You can see that Sally Smith formulated a 45-page single-space report of her review of literally thousands of medical records. I should have caught this at the beginning, and I didn't. I thought the opening statement for Mr. Hunter was very promising. I thought it was very prepared. It was, it was, it was a demonstration of what, uh, when you spend a lot of money on uh, attorneys and, and what they can present in the way of uh, presentations, the presentation was phenomenal. But I should have caught this. He used the term investigation there, and he used Sally Smith's report. Well, we have a lot of Chapter 39 immunity issues in this particular case. Chapter 39 immunity, for those of you guys who are not familiar with it, the Department of Children and Families, DCF for short, employs third-party contractor well, a partnership rather, the Child Protection Team, CPT. Sally Smith was the medical director of the Child Protection Team. So this team in liaison with Department of Children and Families, what they do is they conduct investigations. 
into allegations of medical child abuse and child abuse, abandonment, neglect. And when they find evidence suggesting that, they file a petition with the court to seek the removal of a child from the parent's custody and care. That was kind of what started. Well, I don't, I don't want to say started. That 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 was a big, big part of the facts that we discuss in this whole, I'm going to call it the incident, not the case yet. So a lot of the incident revolved around the investigation and whether the conduct of the hospital in cooperation with that investigation is somehow something that the hospital can be held liable for. Well, the judge has previously ruled, it's gone up on appeal and come back down, that the hospital cannot be liable. They cannot be held liable for actions that were taken that are protected under Chapter 39 immunity. If the hospital is taking action in compliance with um, orders written by the court, with the DCF investigation, once the DCF has jurisdictional authority to conduct that investigation, if the hospital is compliant with those orders and, and in, engaging in furtherance of that investigation, they cannot be liable for that. That has rubbed people the wrong way, but I've been very clear on the law on this one, and the judge has too. The hospital is immune. We had a jury instruction that said that if the hospital is engaging in conduct that is in conformity with these orders, they cannot be held responsible for that. So why is Mr. Hunter talking about that? Why was the focus of the opening statement on the investigation and not some of the incidents that were being described in the, by the plaintiffs in their opening? Now, he glosses over them. He does. He, he covers them. We're going to go over that in a second. But this part, I, I should have caught it. And the longer this trial has gone on, the more that this has become interesting to me in how the hospital is presenting their case. I want to be clear here. I'm not, right now, at this stage in the, in the case, there's competing evidence on whether Maya Kowalski is, was properly diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome. CRPS, or whether the hospital was correct in, in diagnosing or in assuming that it was either conversion disorder or factitious disorder, or heck, the hospital had billing codes for Munchausen symptom, Munchausen's by proxy. Um, but the more that the hospital started focusing on this, I was going, are we missing the forest through the trees? I don't know if that's the right analogy. It might be, it might not. Let me do this, though. We're, let's listen to a little bit more of his closing argument, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap up where my head is. And then that's kind of the preview for where we start with today's testimony and today's arguments. To come up with her diagnosis, you're going to see a lot of effort and care and expertise went in to the effort made to treat this child at, at, at Johns Hopkins Health Children's Hospital. We believe that the evidence will be unequivocal. That, that degree of effort, insight, investigation, and monitoring and care. There's investigation again. There's investigation again. Comported in every respect with what is reasonable and what is recognized as being reasonable and appropriate by other similar physicians. And we don't believe you're gonna hear any credible evidence otherwise. You heard the judge give you a, a, a definition of medical negligence, I just kind of paraphrased it. But the point I'm making to you is that the evidence will ultimately show that these doctors and these nurses and this hospital staff acted reasonably and prudently to treat a difficult and challenging case they were presented with, and they did it consistently over three months. They don't have to be right under the law. All they have to be is reasonable. That one, that remark, they don't have to be right, they just have to be reasonable. 
And at the outset, I was going, well, that's an interesting thing to say in your opening statement when the allegations of the plaintiff were as the conduct. But the more that the case has proceeded, I'm 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 willing to concede that there's contested facts that says that the hospital in their suspicion was was reasonable in their suspicion. People were critical of me for listening to the plaintiff's evidence and saying the plaintiff had a strong case. I said, wait till I get to the defense side. I'm at the defense side. And there's testimony from various medical providers about what conditions she presented with, the behavior of the parties in the hospital. But th for me, this isn't about that. We're focusing on whether the hospital was reasonable in in concluding that there was a possibility of Munchausen symptom by proxy, whether they can make that diagnosis or not, or conversion disorder or something. It, for me, it's not the diagnosis. This isn't the diagnosis. The crux of the case comes down to a few factual incidents that took place that so far I haven't seen good explanation for. Now, there's still a few witnesses to come. Kathy Beatty is taking the stand on Monday, and I and she is it, one of the primary characters involved in several of the incidents. And I, of course, the defense is bringing them on, bringing her on Monday because I always say, start strong, finish strong. You start with a strong witness, you finish with a strong witness. So Kathy Beatty has. There's a lot of gaps that that has that has to cover here, because as we sit today. I'm still looking at these various incidents and I haven't heard good explanation for some of the conduct, some of the conduct that forms some of the, the very core of the plaintiff's case. I'm still going to keep an open mind. I have throughout this entire trial. People dispute that all the time. But for me, I'm at a place where, and I wonder if, if the jury is here too. I don't know. Why haven't I heard explanation about these things? Why is it that we're talking about the diagnosis over and over and over again? If I were to give you that point, let's say that I were to hand that point over to the hospital, Mr. Hospital J. Hatch, Mr. and Ms. Hospital, whatever you want to call them, J. Hatch, what if I give you that point? What if I say, okay, here's the point. You can, there you go. No CRPS. If I were to concede that point, how do you still explain the other stuff? And that was one of the things that Mr. Shapiro raised when they were having that discussion last Friday. Was Mr. Shapiro makes the claim and makes the statement very emphatically. He says, I don't care if it was Munchausen symptomized proxy or if it was CRPS, the hospital, the standard of care and the standard of treatment is the same for both. And that put it into my head, basically saying, if the the symptoms that my that Maya was experiencing, if the pain that she was expressing had either a psychological condition or a neurological condition, the hospitals kind of acknowledged that the standard of care for both of those circumstances was the same. Cognitive behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, uh, occupational therapy, and pain management, right? So if the standard of care is the same under both, then why am I still looking at these specific incidents and having concerns and having questions? That's the point. Mr. Hunter and Mr. Hughes, Mr. Hunter, throughout the trial, we have learned that Mr. Hunter has been on the emails. He was on the emails when this was in front of the dependency court. He was involved as an attorney for the hospital back then. We have this, this thing that we talk about as attorneys when we practice and when we have cases that are we're litigating, right? When we have cases that we're litigating, there is such a thing as an attorney being too close to the case. If you're too close to the case, you can lose sight of the arguments. You can lose sight of ways that your arguments might be flawed. I think this is a flaw in their argument. So I, I think this is a flaw on their overarching theme for the case and their continued focus in a lot of the debates. And we're going to get to one of the more heated exchanges today between Mr. Hunter and Judge Carroll. 
their continued focus on this case is is on disproving CRPS and proving an allegation of medical child abuse on the part of Beata Kowalski. But that's not that's not what what's at issue here. Rather, that's not those aren't the points that I'm seeing as being the core parts of this case, the core parts of the damages being sought. Now, the damages figure, that dollar figure might be substantially lower than the 220 million that they're seeking. That might be way lower than that. And I have questions on damages and causation when you talk about one of the largest claims, which is the the wrong intentional infliction of emotional distress when it comes to Beata Kowalski. I think the plaintiffs haven't really closed that loop for me. Get the connection, make the connection there. That's not there. And I don't know that they really can based on the evidence, unfortunately, because Beata's passed. But when the defense seems intently focused on proving that CRPS didn't exist, I have found myself in the past two days, witness after witness after witness after witness going, okay, even if I'm with you, if I'm with you here, how does this explain those other things? It's a problem I have. And it's also what's led me to believe that the judge's rulings on the 403 issue 403 being the information is relevant. However, the prejudicial effect of the irrelevant information exceeds greatly the relevance of that information to the jury and to the determination of the ultimate issue. A lot of the things that we've been discussing or a lot of the arguments that these attorneys keep having is on the 403 issue. How much are we allowed to introduce as far as the ketamine use, as far as the past conduct, as far as Mexico, as far as what's being allowed to be infused? I want you guys to please understand this. I am not talking about whether the DCF investigation was valid or not. I am not talking about medical child abuse existing or not. Even if, let's say hypothetically, even if I were to concede that the hospital was acting in some fashion in some at some of these occasions in compliance with a valid investigation. And even if there was suspected medical child abuse, and even if all of those circumstances existed, how can the hospital continue to explain that some of these actions were in and furthering the care of Maya? And that's where I'm, that, that, that right there to me that's where I'm struggling and I'm trying to be as neutral and balanced as I can. I'm trying to be as neutral and balanced as I can in, in, in making this assessment. I'm conceding all of the hospital's arguments. If I concede every single argument the hospital is making, how am I still, how am I there? So the hospital still has a few days left. They still have a few days left. And I'm still going to keep an open mind to all of this. I'm still going to try and give you guys the best on best explanation that I can of the things that I'm seeing happen in court. But I, I spent quite a while today contemplating this and yesterday because it this one is tough for me. Let's finish up with the opening argument and, and get into some of the testimony. We will suggest to you the evidence will show First, they probably were right, but even if they weren't, they were more than reasonable. At the end of all this, at the end of all the evidence, I'll have another chance to visit with you or my colleague, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, you're going to hear a lot between now and then. And again, I appreciate very much your, your uh, attentiveness and your diligence, as does my client and the people at uh, all children's hospital i thank you for your attention and look forward to working with you in the next few weeks thank you mr hunter for that so yeah i still have some questions because from what we've heard 
what we've heard so far is the photographs, the nurse on the photographs. Uh, so Kathy Beatty's depot said that the photographs were a direction from risk management, but we haven't seen anything to substantiate that. The nurse said that the photographs were done and she was there to care after Maya and care for Maya. And I'll concede the hospital's argument. There were two sets of photos, but why are they not in the medical records? If they are there for the purposes of care and treatment, why are they not in the medical records? Why are they not in the medical file? Why are they in the risk management file? The EEG room. If the EEG room and that 48 hour observation was taking place for advancing the medical treatment and care of Maya Kowalski, why is Dr. Sally Smith, who's investigating, why is she the one that's instructing or, or suggesting it? You have to bifurcate the issue of investigation and treatment. You have to. And when the hospital makes a claim of this is a muddy line, the judge has come back and says, yeah, it is. And a lot of it is because of the involvement of someone that you had who had staff access to these records and the conduct of that person who had staff access to the records. So, like I said, I have a lot of questions. And I don't know that we've gotten to the point where I've gotten those answered yet. Now, Kathy Beattie still to take the stand. I think Sally Smith yesterday, I, I've, I'm breaking down a video, and this is a programming announcement. Programming announcement. Tomorrow evening. Hang on, I'll swoop for this one. I'll swoop for this one. Programming announcement. Tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., um, I'm going to be live with uh, Spidey from the channel The Behavioral Arts, and I'm going to be giving him a legal breakdown of some of the testimony that Sally Smith presented that was presented in court. I'm not going outside of court. I'm going in court. Information that was presented in court that was presented in the form of deposition and live testimony. And don't tell Spidey this, but I'm going to quiz him. I'm going to quiz him. So he's going to be observing behavior. I'm going to have the prior knowledge of the, the statements that were made in both. And we'll see how we'll see how we do because there were a lot of inconsistencies in how she testified. And I think the jury who has taken 54 page, 54 notepads, 54 notepads worth of notes, they clearly are paying attention too. So I wonder how many of them are going to go back and compare notes between the two sets of testimony. It's a thought. So that's, that's kind of where I'm I'm at right now. Um, let me catch up on a few super chats and we'll get to the today's testimony. Um, as a reminder, I'm still battling a little bit of this cold and the cold is ongoing because I am doing these late night streams and still running full, full steam ahead um, as a full-time practicing attorney. So kind of burning the candle at both ends. And I can tell you what, doing this as a younger attorney, who you could do it. You could do it, but it gets harder. It gets harder the longer you go. So I, I need some rest tonight. So there's no FNF tonight. Um, I am going to redirect you guys over to Kurt, Uncivil Law, at the end of this stream, because Uncivil Law, I have forwarded to him all of my notes on Sam Bankman fried and he has Inner City Press, uh, all the different tweet thread. Inner City Press is in the courtroom, breaking down all of Sam Bankman fried He decided to testify. Sam Bankman fried took the stand. He was like, no, I'm going to be able to explain this uh, to all of you, and you guys are going to understand, and you're not going to find me guilty. If you're interested in legal snark, that's that's what's awaiting you at the end of this stream. So um, all of that was an ADHD sidetrack, because what I was going to say is that I some of these super chats I have to pull up uh, as we are going through the testimony, because if not, I'm going to be here all night and I apologize in advance. If I miss something that you write, I'm trying to catch this, the chats, not just the super chats, but the chat itself and the questions that are in the chat. Uh, for example, in the chat, you guys were asking me how my court, how my, my day was in court today. I convinced the prosecutor to null pros, which is to voluntarily dismiss a lawsuit, um, rather a criminal charge that really had no basis going forward. So it was successful. It was a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. Uh, it was just waiting for the docket to clear before we could go in there and, and get the dismissal done. But so that's two successful court days uh, to this week. So I'm, I'm kind of happy about that. I did see the chat 
Orca, that was very exceedingly generous of you. Thank you very much. Rob, you're doing great at tempering the entire situation and showing grace to all. We appreciate you and it's okay to repeat yourself. I hope you never need a lawyer, but if you do, I hope he or she has your ethics. Orca, that is a compliment that I um I don't know that I'm I'm worthy of, but I do I do aspire to be uh to be of that caliber both morally, ethically, and balanced wise. I, I really do. Thank you. That is exceedingly generous of you. Canonical Heat, thank you very much. Very generous of you. Had to leave before 200K, but I always pay my um, pledges. That was, you didn't need to do that, Canonical Heat. Thank you. I don't, you guys have been exceedingly generous, exceedingly generous. Gingy Probs, this is a good question. This is one that I end up, I end up being, this is where I am right now. Can't all be true. No CRPS, maternal misconduct, and J Hatch appropriate, uh, acted inappropriately. I can see that outcome being reasonable, a reasonable interpretation by the jury based on what we've seen. So, hmm. Yeah. Uh, Abby Rafi, text is the same. I don't know if text is the same or not. Family would not be separated if not for Munchausen by proxy. The I, I don't know. I don't know. Canonical Heat, this is your 50 gifted memberships. Thank you very much for that. That was your that was your quote pledge from last from last night. Thank you. Thank you. Creed M. If that isn't at issue, then why was the plaintiff allowed to present experts and witnesses that Beata was a reasonable caring mother and had zero indication of Munchausen by proxy? And the defense can't refute that now. They can refute it, but they can't bury the hatchet. That might have been a very poor poor term to choose you can refute the allegations but you can't spike the football i think that's the best analysis i can come up with for 403 you can refute but when you go too far down that road it becomes spiking the football and it becomes overly prejudicial because that's not what's at issue in this case i people can disagree with me on this one i i have no problem with you disagreeing with me. i just told you where i am that's it. I told you where I am. And that's where I am with questions. So Azam, thank you. I love seeing you here every time. Thank you for being here. Reminiscent. Reminisce. You're the first lawyer I watched during Johnny Depp. I love the bed debunk video. You've come so far before you. I didn't know law to existed. So thank you, Rob. I hope law number will grow even bigger. I do too. Um, this is something that I have really grown to enjoy and love doing i love i love talking about law i love talking about law and i love explaining it uh not that mickey hi rob your voice sounds different are you okay i am i'm still fighting off a little bit of a cold just because i keep burning the candle and the cold keeps lingering so we're just not shouting this evening that's kind of what it is we're just not shouting this evening plus um I got my my headphones fixed yesterday. I had to listen to uh, background it very quiet, so I might have been talking a little, a little bit louder. So, uh, Brandy, thank you, Rob, sending this out to celebrate my last day of work today, starting my dream job on Monday. Congratulations, Brandy, that's amazing. Thank you for your coverage of the case. Always appreciate that you try to stay objective. Skull, thank you, Brandy. Very kind of you, Doc T J B. I was one of the first 100 who saw your bed video during Dining Depth. Ever heard? So proud of how far you've come. Congrats on 200k. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. Okay. Oh, oh my gosh. Not that Mickey. Thank you. Uh, very kind of you, um, Rob. Did you reach a conclusion regarding who should be accountable for costs during the investigations? So the conclusion that I was able to surmise was that when when the investigation is going forward and when the investigation results in a shelter order that requires the, the child to be housed there, from what I saw in Virginia, that cost of housing the child is borne by the parents. It's borne by the parents. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I'm going to leave that to your interpretation. But what happens and the reason and the basis for that argument is that there was reasonable suspicion and that reasonable suspicion while it is not the proof beyond a reasonable doubt that we we use for uh, criminal trials, it is enough that we place a certain amount of burden on the person who's at the wrong end of that reasonable suspicion or the right end, however you want to phrase it, um, and they have to bear a certain amount of cost. So if you think about this as pretrial detention in criminal matters, right? So a pretrial detention, if you are being held 
there's a bond that you might have to post, right? You have, there's a cost that you have to pay, even though you haven't been convicted yet, there's a cost you have to pay. That cost is one that's borne by you. And this is why we talk about a lot of criminal cases and how they seem and can seem unfair when you have pretrial, pretrial detention orders entered in some cases where there's evidence that might exculpate or um, that might vindicate the conduct or, or serve towards uh, saying that there should be an acquittal, right? But at the foundational stage, I want you guys to view that initial shelter as kind of being a, a bond. That's what that the cost, that's the cost that's borne by the parents based on the, that initial finding. So that was what I was able to discover. So let's do this. I, I, one of my favorite things to do, favorite things to do during these uh, live streams is there's a certain young attorney in the, in the courtroom who um, passed the bar, passed the bar while this case was ongoing. And it's kind of been a bright spot throughout these proceedings to kind of highlight the little things the judge does to make her life, uh, rather her, her career. Um, I like these funny moments, these, these little positive uplifts for younger attorneys. They need it. There's a lot of attorneys that are in this courtroom that are very experienced, very wise, and have been there for quite, quite some time. But when you're a young attorney, it's scary. And I like when I see little acts of kindness in courtrooms, um, little jokes, little jabs, things like this. This is kind of fun for me. So I, I point them out when I can. Um, and Ms. Lawrence had two of those today that I actually was able to stitch into a little video. Why don't we have, starting with the plaintiffs, uh, take appearances. Uh, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you. Ethan Shapiro, Pat Crowles, Howard Hunter, David Hughes, joined by Dr. Jenny Dolan. All right. So Ms. Lawrence got to do the introductions today. It might seem really small. It might seem really small, but it's not. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's really fun. So it wasn't just that, but they came back from break and poor Ms. Lawrence was the only one in the courtroom. Ms. Lawrence, you're in control. You, you're the only one at council table. In case you didn't hear it, she goes, I don't want this power. I don't want this power. I need an adult. I need an adult. Where I need, where, why am I here alone? I don't like this. I need someone. It was so great. The judge, the judge moves so quickly, just immediately comes out and says, all right, it's your, it's your case. Ms. Lawrence, you're in control. You, you're the only one at council table. <laughs> that was my happy moment from today. Um, those two little moments in watching the in watching the court proceeding. Uh, there were other things that were just in, enjoyable to watch from the from the court with theater standpoint, but as far as positivity and positive vibes, that was pretty good. Also, I have a grand suspicion, and I'm going to lay this out pretty quickly. A grand suspicion. Grand suspicion. Next Tuesday is Halloween. There's been a lot of back and forth about what we're going to do on Halloween day in this courtroom. What are we going to do? What are we going to do on Halloween? People in the in the jury box have said, well, one of them has said, I need to be out of here. I need to be at I, I'm trick or treating at 515. And the judge is like, I might be getting instructions from my wife that I have to be somewhere else. And that got me thinking, this jury has, I mean, they've, there's been some pranking. Um, the judge had the jury box decorated for the birthdays of one of the jurors. Uh, the judge and this jury have a phenomenal rapport. And I think the jury has a phenomenal rapport with a lot of the people in the courtroom. Mr. Shapiro has a comment today that I'm going to hope to grab. I, I don't know if I have that timestamp yet, but uh, the jury has been phenomenal in this case. And the, the, the courtroom decorum has been great, but I have a suspicion. What would be the odds of the jury showing up in costume on Halloween? Or one of the attorneys. I think one of the attorneys should show up like in a red wig or something. They asked for wigs. They asked for wigs and voice changes. I think this is the perfect opportunity on Halloween day to give the announcement. Uh, will you please announce for the parties? Uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson shows up in a big red wig. Uh, Greg Anderson for the, for the plaintiffs. And then Mr. Shapiro stands up with a big like yellow wig or however you want to say it. And Ethan Shapiro for the defendants. Come on. Can we do a little pranking? Can we try to put some levity into a trial that is otherwise really difficult for all of us to watch? 
because that would be great. Just saying. Just saying. Don't listen to me. Just some random ADHD lawyer. That was where my ADHD brain went. My ADHD brain went right there. Oh, God, this is great. Wait, hang on. Where was it? Uh, Mary Coppola. The whole jury box should dress as judges. <laughs> or if the attorneys came in wearing wigs and cloaks. Come on. It, yes, it seems inappropriate. Yes, it seems inappropriate. When you are in a courtroom, I will tell you this, having been in several, because this is this is the this is the question from Siam Cat. When you're in a courtroom, having been in so many and dealing with something so sensitive and so difficult, I will tell you that these little breaks, these little breaks of laughter, these little breaks of levity, they are appreciated by everyone involved, even the parties, Maya and Jack, even the parties and Kyle, whoever, these little breaks in decorum, these little breaks in jokes and laughs, they actually are remarkably cathartic because everyone recognizes that this is very serious and they have been treating it very seriously, but you need a little bit of levity in a, in a case like this, a little humanity, uh, maybe, not levity, a little humanity. How about that? A little humanity, you know, before the attorneys go and rip each other's heads off. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Actually, you know what? We're not, we're, we're still, we're still early on. We haven't gotten a testimony yet. I can pull up a little levity. Can I? Cause uh, there's a judge on Twitter who, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the little meme lawyer cat, um, the lawyer cat meme. It's like, your honor, I promise I'm not a cat I promise your honor. I'm, I'm here. I'm not a cat. Well, the judge in that case, he and I follow each other on Twitter. His choice, not mine. His choice. So I, I I try to act accordingly. But he posted something today that had me had me kind of chuckling for a second. And it was this. Judge Roy Ferguson, alternate universe where litigation is a sport. Lawyers enter to blaring theme songs. Judges use a whistle after five adverse rulings. The other side gets bonus points of error. Cheerleaders, live commentary, hot dog vendors, and celebratory dancers after nailing an argument. My response, where can I sign up? Can the lawyers throw down gloves and fight in court until one of them hits the ground? The judge breaks it up, makes him sit, holding in a cell for timeout. Clearly gave this no thought, not at all. By the way, that's that's a reference to hockey rules. That's what that is. Um, no, I would never do that in reality. I would never do that in reality. I would never do that in reality at all. So it just it just kind of is. I, you know. If you don't cry, or if you don't laugh, you're going to cry, right? That's the saying I've always used. I, domestic relations litigation, man, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult area to practice. So let's go ahead and swoop to our first bit of testimony. Okay, so first up, we have... Do, do, do. Dr. McCain. Dr. McCain treated Maya Kowalski at um, Tampa General and uh, gave interesting commentary. Well, not commentary, interesting assessment. And a lot of this ends up being credible. This is where I think this is one of the witnesses where my brain started going, why are we talking about this? Because I got a little bit lost. I understood what, what was being argued, why the defense in the context of investigation was doing this, but I got a little bit confused. May it please the court. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Uh, my name is Jennifer McCain. Okay. Um, uh, and Dr. McCain, there's um, a microphone in front just to make sure that I'm Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, and what's your profession? I'm a um, pediatric neuropsychologist. Okay. Um, and where do you practice most? Um, I work at Tampa General Hospital. Question for the chat. I see that Recovery Addict is here. The question is, do we play one more moment of levity first before we get to Dr. McCain? 
or do we go straight into Dr. McCain and then take a break? I feel like we might need a moment of levity first. I feel like there might need to be a moment of levity first. So got to let me know. Do the moment of levity. Moment of levity. I'm seeing people in the chat. Well, recovery Addison isn't here yet. I think he redirected people. Bring the levity. Well, we'll wait until he pops up in chat. Before that, because I don't want to get into too much of it. Well, hmm. All right. Well, the people that are here from Recovery Addict, you, you, he'll have to rewind and play catch up for a second. It's okay. I had to do it today for most of his stream. All right. Hang on. Levity incoming. Uh, le swoop, swoop to levity. Swoop, swoop to levity. For those of you who don't know, Recovery Addicts has been covering this live and giving live commentary and watching the trial live. Um, so I, I've been following him. His chat's remarkably respectful. He is remarkably respectful of the situation. He entertains uh, various different comments and, and not comments. You're allowed to have different opinions. You just have to express them respectfully. Same rules that I have for my chat. That's a reminder to the chat. You're allowed to have different opinions. You just have to respect, you have to express them respectfully because there's people in this chat that either are afflicted with CRPS, have a child that's afflicted with some chronic pain, has been through an experience with a hospital, and we're not going to just throw shade at everybody. So I, I expect a little bit of uh, respect in the chat and the mods know that. Uh, Recovery Addict handles his chat the same way. And I've appreciated the fact that he's done that with this particular trial. It's a lot better place to watch it than it would be law and crime or somewhere else. But he had a, um, well, we'll just swoop and we'll get to it. Swoop. And where are we? Let's go ahead. Member for nine months, so they can't believe. Okay, stop, stop, stop. I need the, uh, I need the Southern Febreze. Hey, can somebody bring me the raid? There's a bug. There's a bug in my studio, and I don't want to... Uh, turn the camera on it because I'd have to zoom out so it would all fit in the camera lens. It just went behind the cabinet. It's you guys. Oh my goodness. This, this, I will tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is this, that, that bug. And when I talk about bug, I'm talking, you know, it's, it's, it's those, they call them water bugs here in the South. We know what they are and they're not water bugs. That was, that was like, it was the size of a small dog and Occasionally, when we get one of these that come in the inside from outside, and usually when the leaves when they fall down, they're they're around the leaves outside. But when they get into the house, I have uh, I have words to say, and now it's it's literally it's crawling towards my green screen. So I'm going to be on camera like this, and then on the green screen, you're going to see a bug crawl across the wall. That's what's going to happen, and it, and it will be mortifying. It will be it will be so bad. Um, my family is ignoring me. They're playing the uh, the tuba in the other room, but nobody's bringing me the Southern Febreze which is also known as Raid. Uh, you can get it in all different scents. Um, but let's see. I'm... <laughs> you guys, this is... We might have to stop the show. It was it was right there. It was like within arm's reach. Oh, my goodness. We need an indoor cat that eats bugs. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, my goodness. Get the Raid. Get the Raid. You guys, this is, this is literally... I have, I have a couple... A couple of fears in life, and and one of them is definitely um, having one of these bugs make it into the house and crawl across my green screen. It, it might be irrational; it might never happen, but if it does happen, I will never live it down. And and that bug literally is like four feet from my green screen, and it was headed that direction. I need you guys to keep an eye out for it. I need I need you guys to watch for it. Oh my goodness! Uh, I I need the raid. I need the raid. This is bad, guys. It's going to be a bad day. I can't step on it because it's like it was like at waist level on the wall. And my feet don't go that high. All right. So Southern Febreze is ready. Um, here we have uh, not sponsored, not sponsored, by the way. Uh, this is, uh, uh, it looks like it, this is Lavender Scent, Southern Febreze. We're going to put that right where I normally keep my drink and uh, make sure I don't confuse the two. But I, I'm going to be looking like this until I find the thing. Oh, oh it's, it's up. It's up high. 
It's it's literally it's on your head. I'm gonna, don't don't you dare! <laughs> don't you dare! Okay, here's here's what we're gonna do. I'm sorry. This usually we're a little more professional in the mornings than this. Um, we are we're gonna get. I, I can see it. it. It's above me, almost straight up. We have we have 11 foot ceilings in this house. It's an old house, right? We have 11 foot ceilings, and there's a picture rail that runs around about 10 inches down off the ceiling, and it's above. It's between the picture rail and the ceiling, but it's like it is almost straight above me. And when you spray. A bug a that high above you. I've learned from experience. They, they fall, they fly, and they aim for your eyes. This, this is how. <laughs> Angie, please, nobody clip this. <laughs> I don't want to see this on Twitter or anywhere else. Sorry, Scott. If this appears on my green screen, it fell. It fell. It's. So help me, you guys. Okay. Um, it could be anywhere. It's it's now halfway. It's two feet from my green screen. It's now on the ledge that hangs over the top of the bookshelf. I've got eight foot bookshelves in here, and it's on the top ledge, which hangs over my desk. I can I can touch the bookshelf. I'm not going to right now because there's a bug on it somewhere. And and the fact is, I have to stand up. I have to stand up to Musical get this. Notes, happy and it's day. no pants Cockroach. Friday, so I, I've got all sorts of issues going on that are presenting problems. Can't go anywhere, you have to, did you see it? All right, let the cat in. I, will cats eat these? Will cats eat these? Bug will be dead by the end of this, this show, for sure. Bug has nowhere else to go. I mean, it's it's, it's not like there are wires it can hide behind in here. Um, yes, cats will eat them. We've, we're keeping the cat. I'm sorry, Scott. Scott, I am sorry. I am sorry. I'm not sorry at all. I am not sorry at all. That stitching that together was one of the most fun, like the most fun hour I had. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you can't read the screen, I sent him a little super chat. Don't mean to bug you, Scott. It's on my way to court. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> you can see Jez Carroll. This is on this is this is beginning as he's beginning to cover what we're about to cover. Ooh. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott. No, I'm not. Nope. I don't I apologize for nothing. I apologize for nothing. I think the bug is confirmed dead. I think the bug is confirmed dead. Um, we're not sure though. We're not sure. You're just gonna have to. You're gonna have to watch on Monday and see if another one makes it into his house. I can sympathize with him because his house was built in 1915, apparently, and mine was built in 1948. So uh, the bugs, man, <laughs> we get them all over the place, and they're a nightmare. So uh, recovery addict, if you guys haven't been watching, he's been covering this every single day. Like I said, he's remarkably respectful of the testimony as it comes in. Um, he brings a, a little bit of levity to the little breaks in between court, um, but he, he does a, a great job. Oh, he paid his daughter $5 to kill it. <laughs> oh, that, that little stitch, that was that was 25 minutes condensed into that little stitch of little silent times when he kept on going and then paused and stopped and looked around for the bug. Scott, man, I, I've been there. We are professionals. We are professionals. <laughs> oh, oh, God, that was so great. That was so great. It was a, to the daughter's well earned five dollars. I would I would agree. Abby Rafe, I paid my son a hundred dollars to kill a spider. Oh, okay. So the music was great. Thank you. I'm glad you liked it. I, I was trying to find something that wasn't sufficiently creepy, but also kind of set a tone to that background. Um, I don't know. Scott, would you will you let me upload that as a separate video? Can I upload that as a separate video? You gotta let me know. So, yeah, I'm gonna pull up starred relating to this because the last thing I want to do is is uh, uh, talk about uh, funny stuff while we get into the trial. 
Yeah, Shet, this is more effective than antidepressant in a jumbo glass of wine. I'm glad. Uh, Momo WFH, the stitch needs its own video. I need permission. I can't do that. Gamer Ducko, stop lying. You're not sorry at all. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Cachette, he skimped on paying his daughter, gave an IOU instead. It was reproachable. And I'm rather bugged by the whole ordeal. Oh, LA, just noticed you're at 200K. Uh, I've been watching uh, from your bed video to you winning Twitter with Wood Daddy Stacks. And now this trial, congrats. You deserve the hearts. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, Melanie Ann plans. I almost crashed the car because the spider was in the corner of the windshield. I understand this fear. I I get it. I get it. I understand. Um, Cachette, do I need to represent the union again? I don't know. If you do or don't. I don't know. The scroll at the bottom was even apt for it. I guess it was. I guess it was. Spiders and, and bugs are sensitive issues. Okay. All right. Let me do this. Cindy Collins, thank you. I don't want this power. It needs to be a sound bite. Also, please just grab my wake pick, LOL. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Now, now that we've done that, now I got to move on to the testimony. Light Queen, hate to break it to him, but there's rarely only one bug by itself. There will be more. It's not my fear. It's his. It's not my fear. It's his. Um, Kill Canada. I'm glad I live in Canada with all the snow. Hey, you know. So we're going to swoop and get testimony. Swoop in coming. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, maybe we can play that at the end of the stream again. But let's get back to where we left off with Dr. Jennifer McCain. Dr. Jennifer McCain. We've got you. I will turn my volume down because, of course, this court feed is quiet, even though I have it gained up by a million, rather 600%. So we can do this. We're going to take my audio. We're going to lower it. And we'll get to her testimony. Um, in, in terms of your education and training, I'm just trying to see if we can walk you briefly. Uh, where did you get your undergraduate degree? Um, University of California, Santa Barbara. And um, I hate to date people, but you <laughs> um, 92. And what did you do after you graduated from college? Um, I went to graduate school at Long Island University. What did you study? Uh, clinical psychology. And what year did you graduate? I did. Yeah, what year did you graduate? 1996. And uh, what degree did you obtain? Um, a doctorate in clinical psychology. And where did you go for work after that? Um, Peninsula Hospital, Beth Israel. And what were you practicing? Um, partly that was the beginning of a fellowship, and it was neuropsychology and traumatic brain injury. Uh, and, and then within the field of uh, psychology, do you hold any board certifications? Yes, I'm, I'm board certified in clinical neuropsychology and recently boarded with a subspecialty in pediatric neuropsychology. Where do you currently practice? Tampa General Hospital. And how long have you been at Tampa General? Um, a little over 16 years. And what um, what role or do you have any department uh, chairs or titles there? I'm, I'm the vice chief of um, the psychology section for medical staff, and I'm a, a, a pediatric neuropsychologist. Were there times that you served as the chief of psychology at Tampa General? Yes. And for what years? Oh gosh, I don't recall off a, a couple of times, I think. And I, I think, I'm sorry, I don't know the years. Okay. There, were, there were two stints and they're two years each. And this year I'm vice chief. Um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about, um, well, let me just ask you before we talk about my philosophy. Uh, do you have any specialties or subspecialties in the field of neuropsychology? No, um, my, my work at Tampa General is focused on brain injury and trauma and, and pediatric rehab. So we're going to talk about uh, your care treatment of mine before we get there. Have we ever met before? I don't believe so. Okay. I'm not that famous, but <laughs> uh, have we ever spoken before? I, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about your um, time with Maya Kowalski, and I'll just represent to you that Maya was a patient of Tampa General from July 31st, 2015, until about August 27th, 2015, okay? okay. I'm going to show you some of your records, so it won't be a memory contest. Okay. But, um, let me uh, start with asking you, what role does psychology play in a patient like Maya who's admitted to rehab? So psychology is part of the interdisciplinary team, which includes the physiatrist, who is the medical director of the program, a nurse practitioner, and then there's physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech language pathology, child life, um, nutrition, and I don't know if I'm forgetting it. And then the school is also involved. Okay. So I'm going to ask you about some of your treatment of Maya, and it starts at Defense Exhibit 3047-0037. And I'll focus you at the bottom. Your consult's going to be on the next page, but just for the sake of the date at the very bottom, this is uh, your first consult. And just for the sake of time, I'll represent to you that Maya was admitted the day before. Okay. Um, and we can turn the page now. So this is your first consult. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And I'm sorry, is it okay if I get my reading glasses? Yeah, on? please, for sure. Okay. 
Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. At the top, it says, uh, we don't need to focus in, but it says reason for referral rehab, and then it says referred by pediatric rehab. Would that be Dr. Kornberg? To yes. Person? Okay. And Dr. Kornberg would be overseeing the pediatric rehabilitation? Correct. Um, I'm going to ask you about uh, the history of present illness section. And while you're looking through that, what is the history of present illness? It's basically the history of what brought her into rehab. Um, is this the history given to you by the parents? No, it's through their medical records. Okay. Uh, at least in terms of what you had reviewed about halfway down, it talks about an admission to all children's on 7715, and that she was seen by Dr. Casadante in neurology at all children's. Is that right? Correct. Would that have been something that you saw in the review of past medical records? Yes. Um, and then at the bottom of this, uh, it looks like that uh, you had a conversation with Mr. Kowalski. Is that right? You mean, you mean part of the evaluation? Yeah, it says that, um, that, the, that uh, the family had told you the father reported um, a second opinion in Chicago. Do you see that? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so let me ask you a little bit about your uh, what you noted uh, later on in this note at uh, page 0040. In the, at the top it says family historian dad. Um, it, from looking at your notes, would it be fair to say that it was just dad that was with Maya at this point? Yes. Um, and I'm going to go down a little bit to your assessment of neuro, current neurocognitive and behavioral emotional status. And just take a moment to read it. I'll ask you a couple of questions on this section. You're charting in the first sentence about when you entered the room, Maya was coloring and the mood was euthymic? Is euthymic. It? It's neutral, meaning there was no evidence of depression. In reviewing this, when you saw Maya on July 3rd, oh, sorry, yes, July 31st, 2015, did Maya report to you any incidences of pain? I, I, I don't independently recall. It's whatever is in my notes. So this is a theme with this witness. So a lot of these witnesses are this is several, several years ago. They don't independently recall. So this is a witness that is, and, and I use the term regurgitating from her notes, but she's testifying based on her notes. So she's documenting the things that she's observing with Maya Kowalski when she presents with this pain. And she is testifying based on her documentation. She doesn't have an independent recollection. What that means in lay terms is I can't remember I can't give you a, a, an active memory of what actually occurred that day because I don't I don't remember. I don't. This was eight years ago. The thousands of patients I've had between now and then, I can look at my notes and say that I documented things from my notes, and that's what I can give you. That's what this witness does. And they do review their notes beforehand. They do, but their notes their notes can trigger a memory. Their notes can uh you know they might see something and be like oh i remember this patient and then they can actually testify to what they remember but a lot of doctors are very careful about this they're very careful because they don't want to remember the wrong patient let's say that she starts saying i do remember this patient she had the broken leg right mm, no so they're very cautious in this one and i appreciate the fact that they have that level of caution but realistically this this testimony itself on direct could have just been the medical records, but that's dry. The jury's not going to be guaranteed to read those records. So you want the witness to testify to them. So this is a lot of very awkward leading and you'll hear a lot of, I don't independently recall, but she refers to her notes. She is there to basically say, if it's in my notes, it's what I remember from that day. Okay. So if it's in my notes, it's what I remember from that day. That's what she's testifying to. Let's fast forward a bit to 5734. Where are we? Uh, right about here. I wanted to go over exactly what the discharge notice stated. 3047-0056. What's up? Okay. Under diagnoses there, do you see it? Yes. What are the diagnoses? History of steroid-induced myopathy, myalgia and myositis, quadriplegia, and psychological factor affecting physical condition. Okay. Do you see the diagnosis of conversion on there? No, I don't. Um, with a with a child, in fact, anyone. Dang it! I fast forwarded. Rob, you fast forwarded too much through the fast forward. You did the fast forward too much. It was here. Where was it? Uh, where's the big note? Yes. Uh, how was Maya doing on this thing in terms of her pain? I'm sorry. No, it says I met with Maya individually that day. 
Um, Dad must have come in um, at the very end. So this one again, the jury is in there watching and she can't. She's re, she's testifying from her notes. She's allowed to do this. She's allowed to do this. But you can see that she her memory of what's taking place. It's impacted. And the jury is seeing that she's referring to her notes and says, oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Reading down further in her notes saying, oh, dad must have come in later that day. It's not an independent recollection, and I wouldn't expect people to have that recollection going back that far. Like I said, she, like a good practitioner, is documenting the things that are taking place. Um, and you know what? We had the... Guys, if we need to swoop again, we need to swoop again. But we had a, the moments of levity, but now we're in testimony. Let's try to keep the chat comments on on topic so that the mods are able to keep up and so that people aren't remarkably confused when they go to replay and they're going, what's going on? So please keep the chats on comments. Um, we do not talk about uh, breaking news because I haven't had the chance to review it and we don't want to surprise people with things that might be difficult for them to process in the moment. So please keep chat on comment, please, on topic with the testimony that's being testified to, please. If you don't, the mods are going to start timing you out because I need... I need the chat when it goes on replay for people to be able to catch up. And though, because there's a note at the end. So when you initially went to meet with Maya, she was on her own? I, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell from the note. When you had a chance to meet, it looks like you met with Maya while she was in her wheelchair. During that uh, initial meeting, did Maya express you any signs of pain? Uh, no, she did not. Um, you noted that she was putting together a scrapbook. Why was that significant to you? Um, that was significant because she had com um, often complained of um, weakness in her hands and not being able to do those types of tasks. Did that represent improvement to you? Yes, it did. Um, you, you have a conversation in the next sentence about Maya raising concerns about not going to school. Uh, what was your response to that? I, I told her that she would be able to return to school because of her progress. <clears throat> um, you noted that Maya was open in discussing family dynamics. Let me ask you a question about that. Is your discussion of family dynamics something that you typically do with children who are undergoing uh, psychological your psychological care for rehabilitation? Yes. And why is that? Um, because a lot of times the family there's family dynamics that are contributing to the current presentation. Um, what did Maya tell you when discussing uh, the family dynamics? That she wanted to spend more time with mom and mom was um, working a lot. Uh, and it looks like you asked Maya to be able to share that with Mr. Kowalski? Yes. And Maya agreed? Correct. Um, and did you have a chance to talk to Mr. Kowalski about this? Yes, I did. And what did, um, in your conversation with Mr. Kowalski, did he convey to you uh, what his observations were of the interactions between Maya and Mrs. Kowalski? Um, he indicated that mom worked a lot and had um, decreased interactions and time with the family and that he was the primary caretaker. And did Mr. Kowalski uh, express any opinions to you about um, his thoughts on outpatient treatment? Yes, he agreed with it. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to ask you about your next visit, the fifth visit, which starts at 0248. And again, this one starts at the very bottom, but we'll move to the next. Let me tell you how much I would not want to be here in her position. Like multiply it by a thousand. She's testifying based on her notes from eight years ago. Eight years ago. And and Mr. Shapiro's asking her as if she can independently recall it and putting her on the spot. I would hate to be in this position. You can see the reticence in her in her expression. She next page. Uh, and this is the next day you had previously been on. Page 12, uh, so let's put this your note from 813, and I'll let you read your session. Uh, and then I'll have a couple questions for you. Okay. In, in your opinion, after uh, having this session, did it appear that some of Mai's behaviors were trying to get the attention of her mother? Yes. And why, why is that significant to you as a neuropsychologist? That's significant because that's appears to be one of the issues that's contributing to her um, disability. When um, a little later down in the note, um, it looks like you had a conversation with Mrs. Kowalski about conversion disorder. Yes. And what was her response? Um, that she did not agree with the diagnosis. Do you remember anything further about that conversation that you had with Mrs. Kowalski? I don't. <clears throat> and then at the end of your note, you, um, uh, you, you documented a difference in Maya's reaction when you were there and when you left. Is that true? Correct. And how were you able to make those observations? How was I able to make that? Yeah, so just describe how that happens in general. So so when we were talking about going home and um, um, she, Maya was very upset. Um, and when this happened, we were all trying to ignore her behavior. Um, and she was continuing to cry. But when I went up to leave, her behavior stopped immediately. 
Let me ask you about your sixth visit, which uh, starts at uh, 0233. This would be the next day as well. Let me just ask you, is, is this a typical cycle where you're meeting with family and children every day through the course of rehab, or is this a little more frequent if you know? It, it really depends on the diagnosis and the needs of the family and the patient. Um, were my psychological needs from your perspective at this time more intensive? Yes. <laughs> Let me ask you about, about um, your session note. And let me know when you've had a chance to read the first part of it. Hold on, we'll turn to the second page and then we'll come back. Okay. And Clay, if you can go to the next page and just, we'll, I'll let you read the top and then I'll go back to the first other okay. questions. Okay. okay. So let's go back to the. So this is a good question I caught. Why is reading from the notes not considered bolstering hearsay? It otherwise would be. But these notes or these records, these medical records are in evidence. Because they are in evidence, they are allowed to be displayed independently. They actually have independent factual value. The documents themselves do. You will see other notes when the judge asks, are these in evidence? And when the, when the answer is no, they are not. The attorney then says, may I refresh the witness's recollection? And you don't get the document into evidence, but you're allowed to refresh the recollection. These notes are actually in evidence. They are part of the mes medical records. They are a business records exception to hearsay rule. So they are actually given substantive value and weight as evidentiary records of past medical treatment. It's relevant for purposes of the medical malpractice case because the patient's condition, their medical history is relevant for the day that they produce to the hospital, the day they appear at the hospital, for the treatment that goes forward from there. You have to know what they've been through to know how they're being treated to an extent, to an extent. And we'll get to that in a minute. But that's why she's allowed to testify from the notes because they are all, they are already in evidence. That's why. Previous page, Elliot, oh. 0233. Um, and then this, this is the sixth visit. Uh, it, you had a meeting with mom, is that correct? Correct. And why do you note that you are observing my in physical therapy? Why would you be doing that? Um, to see what her progress was like, see if there was any inconsistent behaviors. And then in the next sentence, you note a conversation about uh, consideration of functional neurologic system disorder. What is that? Um, th that's just a term that's used sometimes interchangeably with conversion disorder. Um, and do you remember, do you have a recall of how this discussion went? No, I don't. According to your note, does it appear to you that mom showed some resistance but openness to this diagnosis? She wanted to um, wait until the neurology consult had been complete before considering it. And what would be the importance of a neurology consult in that regard? To, to rule out any organic neurological disorders. Uh, and just at the bottom, it looks like you were taking well on vacation. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then um, let, me, let me show you. That was an uncomfortable smile. That was uncomfortable. She doesn't want to be here. That becomes even more evident when we get to cross. Mr. Anderson, we had you pulled up, friend. Here you are. Algen myositis, quadriplegic, and psychological factor affecting physical condition. Okay. Do you see the diagnosis of conversion on there? No, I don't. Um, with a with a child, in fact, anyone in extreme pain, would you agree with me that there is always a psychological overlay to some extent? Probably. And so, did it also come to your attention that after discharge, you recommend they follow up? with, uh, I guess, mental health care counseling, that they did, in fact, follow up with Eagle's Wings in Venice? I'm sorry, what was the question? Did, did, you, did you ever determine whether they followed up with either of your recommendations or whether they went to another place, in this case, Eagle's Wings uh, Psychology in Venice? No. If they did, then that would be following up with what you recommended? Correct. How many, just out of curiosity, about how many uh, sessions per week, in your experience, now, you weren't, uh, you weren't board certified in pediatrics at the time, Maya was in, is that right? Uh, pediatric neuropsychology, correct. That, that was not an option at that point. That was a new board. But, but you are now. Correct. All right. And so and the reason I ask that is just your experience about how often in an inpatient setting to be really effective should a uh, psychologist meet with the child. And, and I say that noting that I think you met like five times or over five hours in two weeks. So I just wanted to get an idea of how, how often to get a good result a, a psychologist, psychotherapist should meet with the child. Your Honor, I kept this up. Yeah, that's the thing. So they had an out of court argument on this particular issue of how far she would be allowed to testify. She's being brought in as an observing, diagnosing, treating physician. So she's allowed to testify to what she did in that moment, but she can't really go further and opine beyond that to give assessment of what other doctors would or should have done or what the, uh, or what, uh, the standard of care is. 
Mr. Anderson made the argument at the beginning, which was saying, I don't want her going beyond that. But then in cross-examination, he was like, well, we're going to go beyond that. And the judge kind of reins it back in, says, look, I mean, the judge looking at him going, Mr. Anderson, you want, you wanted me to restrict this. They wanted to bring her on. You wanted me to restrict this. That's just me guessing, speculating. But Mr. Anderson wanted to go further than that because he wanted her to expound upon the treatment and what he would expect in terms of treatment. So let's fast forward a bit more. 113, 43. I think we're right about there. Here we go. One, we'll start here. Now we're in redirect. Okay. From your review of the note, did it appear that Mai was having pain from therapy or did the pain come out of the blue from some other source? It seemed to come out of the blue. And then lastly, I was going to you were asked about uh, whether there was a discharge diagnosis. I mean, again, for planning for discharge, can you explain to this jury you're sitting down with the interdisciplinary team to come up with a diagnosis altogether? Is that how this works? No, the diagnoses, um, I, I don't know if Dr. Kornberg enters them, but every diagnosis entered is included in that list. Do you contribute your thoughts directly to Dr. Kornberg so he can have the benefit of your neuropsychological impressions? Yes. Let me show you what's um, in evidence as uh, St. Chart Clay, but at 0010. You were asked a question, we'll represent to you, this is Dr. Kornberg's discharge diagnosis. You were asked a question whether conversion disorder or psychological factors were part of the discharge. Uh, take a moment to read this, please. Okay. Um, was um, your suspicion of conversion disorder included in the potential discharge diagnosis of mine? Yes, it was. Thank you for your time. Dr. Korn. Oh, I forgot, Anderson jumps up. A neuropsychologist. No, he's not. So, we have here, Maya had a apparently inexplicable source of pain at times. Okay. Yes. Anything further? Uh... All right. So here's what we have. And, and Dr. McCain, I promise you, I am, I know that you're upset being there. I don't mean to pause on you like that. I'm, I'm just saying you don't want to be there. I get it. I'm sorry that you had to go through this. I wouldn't want to be there either. There's a lot of back and forth over whether Maya was seen by a neurologist or a psychologist, right? So that was kind of the crux of this argument. Mr. Shapiro is going on and saying that there were psychological factors. Mr. Anderson saying, but she wasn't seen by a neurologist. There wasn't an independent neurological examination. And the question that in my mind shifted, this witness shifted my, my thought process not how you might think. My thought process became neurological or psychological. Why are we arguing over whether there were neurological conditions that affected the, the pain or psychological conditions that affected the pain? I get the understanding that psychological conditions might be imposed or altered by somebody else. Neurological itself is actually a medical condition. I understand that part, but what you basically have to us lay people, to me, a lay person, I'm sitting here going, there's something in the brain that is affecting and altering the level of pain that's being experienced by this child. Okay. So I go there. That's if that's where my brain is. If, well, the brain is duplicative in that moment. But if my thought process is that there is something, whether it's psychological or neurological, that's affecting how this child experiences pain, then now I understand what the hospital was saying, that you treat this with therapy. I actually started this because I saw it fly by in the chat. Mama Bear made the point. You can still point to the fact that she spent more time with Maya in two weeks, five hours in two weeks, than Jay Hatch did in three months on therapy. I missed that the first go round. I, I I saw the focus on five hours and the five and three did. I didn't catch the fact that it was within a two week period. So she was subpoenaed. She had to answer questions. And now we get to jury questions. Dr. McCain, the jury had a couple of questions. So I'm just going to ask. Them. Oh, wait, we need the jury questions bumper. The court has said our favorite thing. Bring the jury bring the jury bring the jury jury questions or ask those questions to you okay in your testimony you've used the phrase similar to quote psychological contribution end quote should i interpret this to mean there is a mental component but there is also a physical component or does your phrase psychological contribution mean there is no physical component Thank you, juror. Thank you, juror. Thank you. Hi, same page. 
same page. I'm figuring this out too. That's a hard question to, I mean, there's a physical component because there are physical symptoms and those symptoms are real, but we cannot find a physical diagnosis to explain those symptoms, but they continue to be real. But the, the, what is fueling those symptoms are psychological factors. You said you don't know what a quote normal child is end quote with your training years of practice fellowship and board certifications could you possibly agree that there are certain quote norms end quote that can or should be used in evaluating what is quote normal end quote behavior in this case for a child raised in Maya's social economic family unit yes um well, let me continue i think it kind of goes on we don't have a general quote baseline end quote to use and if you don't know what a normal child is how do you know when a child is abnormal or in need of your services and I think there are certain situations where you have normal, like for instance, IQ, you have, uh, you know, you have what is considered normal performance and you have aberrations of that. I think in terms of behavior, you have norms. Um, but I, I just think generally I'm talking about what is normal to a child. Every child is so different. I think that's what I was referring to. Mr. Uh, Shapiro, do you have any follow-up? Just briefly, I'm going to go back to 0372. That's not the follow-up that's the most impactful. Let me tell you the follow-up that gets... Actually, we can watch it from here because we do get to it. Because Shapiro asks one question, and we get back to Mr. Anderson. You can take up the bottom part of the page for a minute. You asked about psychological factors. Was it was part of your assessment of that based on inconsistencies that you saw in Maya's presentation? Yes. And um, in terms of her behavior and the the uh, your observation of some of it being exaggerated, um, what what was the significance to you of Mr. Kowalski also seeing that behavior? Um, because in a condition like this, the more that the parents and caregivers understand what's going on, the more appropriate support they can give to help with progress. Thank you. That's all. Mr. Anderson, any further questions? I'm going to show you a clip here. Two questions. The first one is, have you seen this before? And I'm not going to show the whole clip. I've seen it many times. But, uh, I just wanted to show you a little bit here. The second question is, does it appear that this child is trying as hard as she can? She might be. Yeah, that was good. Can you press up a little bit for me? That's Marissa Higgins? <laughs> yes. There you go. Come on, ready. Come on, you're doing it. Goes forward. Goes forward. There you go. All right. Come on, Lefty. Come on. It's not talking. What's going on? You gotta talk it. Talk it to it. Come on, you gotta talk it up. conversion disorder based on my experience with her yes anything further mr spiro okay, members of the jury any further questions that was not she that is not someone who wants to be here this bothered me a bit so we heard other we heard other individuals that had kind of testified when the plaintiffs were putting on their case about the things that they assessed and how they made that assessment and that they didn't know anymore that they wouldn't know right now. Um, she looks really uncomfortable, and I do not envy her being in this position at all. I think this is, this sucks. Hospital called her. They subpoenaed her. She was required to appear. She was required to testify. And here's the thing. She's in a catch 22. Either she was wrong in her notes and now her medical expertise is subject to question and debate whether or not she understands or remembers anything about this case. Or she says that maybe not based on a video and viewing a video and her understanding of what has transpired in this case. There is no right answer for her there is none 
but I, Mr. Anderson, if you can, if you think of how Mr. Anderson views this, she doubled down. I get that she people think that she doubled down. We have seen doubling down. Um, that was Sally Smith. That was doubling down. This was less doubling down. This was uncomfortable to me. I did not like watching this testimony because I was uncomfortable. And Anderson is just staring daggers into her. That's disappointment. That's disappointment. And that, that to me, if the jury is observing that demeanor, this exchange, if they're there watching this, if they're there seeing how she's on the stand and seeing Mr. Anderson and then that look on his face, that's freaking tough, man. That doc was in the freaking tough spot. And that's, it just felt. Where was it? Where was it? I just saw it. Where was it that said, I want to cry? Yeah, she wants to cry. I want to cry. I want to cry. She disappointed me too. I was, I, I felt it. Truthful, but uncomfortable. I, I had a lot of trouble with this witness. I don't know. Thank you, Jules. Jules was in court today. Jules can, I, I trust Jules on this assessment more than anything else. Anderson had tears in his eyes. I don't doubt that. That witness had more impact on me in favor of the plaintiff's case than anything else. Because on me, here's what that witness brought home. I just told you, I mean, I told you guys a little bit, a little bit ago. Psychological or neurological if the mind is controlling or the mind is altering how she's perceiving pain the pain perception and the treatment is what this doctor has said supposed to be the same how does that make what jay hatch did when they were presented with a similar case how does that make that okay so i have i had trouble with that that to me, that was a backfire. That was a backfire. I don't think that helped the defense. Conversion disorder. Because the other thing that came out in the testimony, conversion disorder, does not mean that it is factitious disorder imposed on another or Munchausen symptom by proxy, uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Conversion disorder is all they were discussing which is not the, the statement that the child is faking it or the child is having this imposed on them. It's that there's a neurological or psycho, there's a psychological condition that's affecting how the child is perceiving pain. So that, that was my takeaway from that witness. You guys might have different assessments or interpretations. I have zero problem with that. You can disagree with me till the cows come home. I'm just explaining to you kind of how I perceived it. How that ended up working, all the above. Um, so let me get to my next timestamp. Brief break, we go on a break, they bring the jury back, and now we bring in 154.06. And we now get to do a swoop doop So coming to the stand is Mr. Baker. And I wonder, I can't remember if Shapiro, if it's the, if it's this version or this time when Shapiro makes the question, no, it's in front of the jury, the jury. It's later. Yes, ma'am. Where's it now? I think it's now. May it please the court. Um, good morning, sir. Can you introduce yourself to the jury, please? Good morning. My name is Jason Banker. Uh, I'm the executive director of Revenue Cycle. 
or Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And Mr. Baker, you may want to pull the microphone just a little bit closer to you, so that way um, everyone throughout the courthouse can hear you. I apologize um, about that. And just to just to repeat, um, can you tell the jury what is your job title? Yes, I'm the executive director of Revenue Cycle Site Services for Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. So let me um, take you back because I have a habit of dating people. Mr. Shapiro, I'm sorry. I do this all the time. I'm sorry. I make I make comments that I constantly regret later in the choice of words that I employed. It's just, it's a word choice thing. It's a word choice, me. It's a word choice thing. And um, Mr. Shapiro, I've been there, my friend. I have been there, my friend. And Mr. Baker, you may want to pull the microphone just a little bit closer to you, so that way um, everyone throughout the courthouse can hear you. I apologize um, about that. And just to just to repeat, um, can you tell the jury what is your job title? Yes, I'm the executive director of Revenue Cycle Site Services for Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. So let me um, take you back because I have a habit of dating people. I'm not dating them that way, but dating them. It came out awkward. It's Friday morning. It's all right. It's quite all right. All right let's just go that way. We're not dating. I don't know. All right. All right. Let's let's start. Should we call your spouse? Yeah. I say I have to make a phone call. Shall we call your spouse? I have to make a phone call too. Oh, God. Oh, Mr. Shapiro, I have done it. How many times have I made a comment on chat? Mm. I've been there. I have a habit of dating people. I have a habit of dating people. I have a habit of going back and, and establishing their credentials historically. Thank oh, goodness yeah. this isn't on national TV. <laughs> All right. Now that we got that out of the way, tell the jury, where did you go to undergrad? Yes, I went to school at Bloomsburg University, which is located in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, my undergrad is in finance and business economics. And I was also fortunate enough to attend Bloomsburg University to get my MBA with a concentration in leadership. And what year did you graduate with your MBA? I graduated in 2005. And have you, after you graduated, what type of uh, career or profession did you pursue? Sure. My first job coming out of college and undergrad uh, was in December 17, 2001. I started out in healthcare finance. As a financial analyst, that was my first job. And I've spent the last 22 years in various finance, healthcare related roles. Um, have you spent the majority of your career in healthcare finance? I've spent all of my career in healthcare finance. And, and what is your current uh, role at All Children's Johns Hopkins? If you can explain to what is your day-to-day? -day? Sure. So my day-to-day, -day, um, I make sure that the Hang patient experience from being registered at the visit, right? So when you come in, we make sure that I'm part of the scheduling process, the registration process for the visit. After the patient is seen by the provider, I'm overseeing the coding that is done by the certified coders to make sure that they capture all the services that were rendered. And then responsible for making sure that a clean bill goes out the door and follow up with the insurance company to make sure that we receive payment as well as address any concerns that might be in place for any patient balances that are outstanding afterwards. Um, have I, have I, uh, we, we had a chance to meet last night? That's correct, sir. And um, I told you what I was calling you the witness stand. That's correct, topic. sir. Okay. Um, I, did I, have you had a chance to review the hospital, hospital bills for Maya Kowalski for her inpatient stay of October 2016 through January 2017? Yes, sir, I had. I had the ability to go through and take a look at the hospital claims that were filed on behalf of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital to Aetna and was able to take a look and see of all the transactions that took place. Um, have you also had a chance to review the interaction between um, the Kowalskis and Aetna regarding claims, processes, and denials? That's correct, sir. I was able to receive and take a look at those communications through the online portal between the Kowalskis and Aetna regarding uh, any uh, procedures that were performed or any uh, bills that took place. Based on your training and experience... Honor, I'm sorry, let me approach briefly. Okay. Let me explain what's happening here. What we're about to get to is um, what we're about to get to is a, is voir dire. So at this point in time, the witness was allowed to testify as a fact witness. So there's fact witnesses who can testify to things they have factual and actual knowledge of. That level of factual understanding extends to some of the things that are beyond them, right? If I'm a supervisor, I can testify to things that are in records, business records that my staff prepares. Um, if I'm an attorney, I can testify to uh, the validity of the hours that are billed by my paralegal. I can testify to those things, right? That's a factual thing I can say. I am not allowed to give an opinion or speculate on what things that are outside of that direct control, I can't speculate on that. That would be giving an expert opinion, something that's outside the scope of my actual knowledge. So this is a foundation objection. This is an objection based on the fact that, or the argument that this, this person does not have an adequate foundation to testify factually to the billings of 
Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. So now we get into, we actually get to see part of the trial that we don't often get to see, which is a voir dire of a witness to determine if they have the ability or capability to, to testify um, in certain subject matter. Because the objection comes up a couple of times before the judge kind of excuses the jury and says, we're going to do this outside the presence of the jury. Before Mr. Shapiro begins. I'm sorry? May I have a lot of witness before Mr. Shapiro begins? I'd like to make a problem. Uh, Mr. Shapiro is at the uh, lectern. And... Can we put up trial exhibit 2017 655? Do you see on the right hand side where it says provider name, Johns Hopkins, all short? Sorry. So this is the argument they get having. Here, I, I didn't fast forward enough because Shapiro starts walking through the bills and then the insurance statements and how they're different and how um, what he is saying is that Hopkins, J. Hatch, was billing for things that were not CRPS. So he's he's testifying to the billing codes saying that these things were not being billed. Um, Your Honor, this witness has been called by the defense to uh, oh, refute the suggestion that all children's billed $500,000 for CRPS. Rob, this was about to testify. man. CRPS was one of many diagnoses that gets bundled together into a group of codes that are then submitted to Aetna that then reimbursed. There's this. There's a few more minutes, so I'm going to ask that you uh, Here we go. Found it. Just a second. Sorry, guys. And receive more all right, perfect. I just got lost for a second. Mr. Shapiro, you know, may I have a witness before Mr. Shapiro begins? I'm sorry? May I have a your witness before Mr. Shapiro begins? I'd like to make a profit. Uh, Mr. Shapiro is at the. Uh... I was in the right place. Rob. So Mr. Shapiro is now going to make a proffer to the judge as to why this particular witness should be allowed to testify in this regard. The objection was made at the sidebar. So the judge is now saying, Mr. Shapiro, you want to lay a foundation. You want to give me a reason why this witness should be allowed to testify to these things. Why, why you can overcome that foundation hurdle. I'm going to let you do it. Here's your foundation. Lay the foundation. Tell me why I should let this witness testify to billing codes that don't appear to be prepared by J. Hatch. So Shapiro has a burden. He has to basically say this person has an expertise or an actual knowledge of these things and can testify to these things that are within his actual knowledge. Um, and then Mr. Whitney, who does cross, you guys know how I like Whitney. Uh, the the cross-examination style is very much my own. Um gets to do a little bit of credential examination on this particular witness. Can we put up trial exhibit 2017-655? Do you see on the right-hand side where it says provider name, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? That's correct, sir. And in your review of the hospital bills, you, you have reviewed the actual hospital bills at All Children's, correct? That's correct, sir. And I'll represent to you that the plaintiff never put those in evidence. So what I will ask you is this question, from your review of this transaction report from Edna. Does it appear to you to match the diagnosis code submitted by all children's to Aetna for my Kowalski? It appears to be in line with what I have seen. That's correct. In, in your training and experience, do you have sufficient knowledge to educate this jury when you look at the diagnosis codes about how those would relate into a bill submitted by all children's to Aetna? Yes, sir. And would you be able to educate the jury about how those codes, well, let me back up. Are you aware whether these were the codes that all children's generated when they sent them to Aetna? I've seen many of these codes based upon the claims that I reviewed, sir. And are you able to educate the jury on how these codes all coming together would form what's called the diagnostic related group? Yes, sir. And would you be able to educate the jury on how the diagnostic related group code when combining these would generate a medical charge? Yes, sir. And um, have you had sufficient training and experience throughout your career to be able to give that knowledge to the jury? Yes, sir. Okay. That's all I need for the proper amendment. Mr. Whitney. Good morning. By way of background, if I was listening close enough, you have an MBA? That's correct, sir. And then uh, how long after your MBA did you join Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? I've been with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital will be here in November, sir. And I've been in healthcare finance for 22 years. I'm sorry if I missed this. Would you just run through the different entities you've worked for over those 22 previous years? Sure. I worked for Geisinger Health System for the Geisinger Health System for the first 15 years of my career, Penn State Health for approximately three years of my career, Title Health for three years of my career, and now I've been with Johns Hopkins. It'll be a year in November. All right. 
Try to take those in order for me. Yes, sir. Geisner Health. Geisner Health System. This is a hospital system. It is a massive health system. Approximately six billion dollars in annual revenue. Right, and you worked in providing. I'm guessing. Tell me if I'm wrong. At, within the health system, providing bills to the insurance company. I was the director of revenue cycle integrity for uh, Geisner Health System for a period of time uh, that dealt with coding issues, billing issues, CDM issues, charge capture issues, things of that nature. From Sorry, did you say revenue integrity, sir? Revenue integrity. All right. So Whitney loses the argument, but we're going to go forward to examination when the jury is back. So Whitney loses the argument. He's allowed to testify. He has enough knowledge of how the billing system works in medicine that he can testify to what he perceives and that it's it's fair game for cross-examination. And I I will I will tell you this, Whitney does not disappoint in that regard. So the judge the judge has said repeatedly that if you if if you feel like they're navigating navigating into territory that is no-go territory, you can object. You can cross-examine. That's proper scope. And these lawyers have not backed down from that. Oh, hi, Jules. I see you back there. Jules is right there over the gentleman in the uh, headphones behind plaintiff's counsel in the pink. Lovely choice of color. So I see you there. Jules is in the chat tonight. So they're going to have this argument. Judge makes the ruling. And the witness takes the stand again and testifies in front of the jury. So, have you seen any media about this case? No, no it's approach you. No. Mr. Security, you may Thank you. Um, Clay, if you don't mind putting back up, trial exhibit 2017 655. Um, and Mr. Banker, in your role, are you familiar? Do you oversee the people that do medical billing coding? Yes, sir. In, in your role, are you familiar with what the various diagnoses cause? Yeah, from what I'm seeing here, yes, sir. And again, we left off looking at the top. Uh, type of service provided uh, was uh, what, sir? It appeared to be room and board. Okay. So let me talk to you about the diagnosis codes. You see down below there's approximately 12 of them? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what I'd like you to tell the jury is this. How do these diagnosis codes generate into, well, before I do that, um, if, if, uh, well, let, actually, let me ask you, how do these diagnosis codes relate to a medical charge? How, how do these come together? Sure. So these diagnosis codes, what happens is a provider goes in, they see the patient, they do some form of workup with the patient, whether it's a consult, whether there was labs performed, whether there was any testing done, any services rendered. So a physician or provider is responsible for documenting all of the services that they render on that patient, okay? Then we have a group of certified coders who go in, read the chart, read what services were performed, and then assign the appropriate CPT or HIPSPEX code for those services rendered. So um, actually, let's put up uh, is 1001-31, 0031. 1001-0031, and if you go to the next page, uh, next page, please. I'll get there eventually. Next page, next page, next page. And uh, one more page. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Uh, Mr. Danko, I'll represent to you that this is a history physical that uh, my calls came at all children's hospitals on October 7th. And um, if you can highlight under impressions and chronic diagnoses, um, do you see where it says complex regional pain syndrome diagnosed by outpatient physicians? That's correct, sir. Is, is this the type of information that, in your experience overseeing coding, that the coders would look for to see uh, what types of diagnosis codes to put on a medical bill? Yes, sir. They would take a look at this. So let's go back to um, what we we're talking about, trial exhibit 2017655. And again, we'll expand. There you go. Um, so now we see uh, the, the first diagnosis there, complex regional pain syndrome. And then there's a number of other diagnosis codes on the left. Um, so, for example, uh, they line up, but maybe you can help. Is the G90.59, what does that diagnosis code for? That represents complex regional pain syndrome. And then the T76-02XA, what is that? Child neglect or abandonment suspected. And then the next one, uh, B37.81. Yeah, candidal esophagitis. Okay. And, and first, you're not a medical doctor, right? That's correct, sir. Okay. So um, without wasting time and going through all 12, um, can you explain to the jury how did these 12 uh, diagnosis codes get on there. Is that from the coding process? That's from the provider documenting all the services that they have rendered. And then the coder, the professional certified coder, comes in and actually signs the codes based upon the services that are rendered. And okay. there's a separation of those kinds of duties to ensure the accuracy and integrity of what's being done. Yeah, and can you, if you can explain to the jury what you mean by that separation of duties. Yeah, we like to ensure that the coders, every organization that I've ever worked at, the, the professional certified coding teams uh, have a working relationship with providers, but they do not have a reporting relationship to the providers. We do that to allow for accuracy and integrity of the work that's being done. We want to ensure that the coders are not biased in what they're utilizing for the, for the codes that they're putting down for the services that are rendered. 
So how does the, these codes work together to, to generate a bill? So these codes work together um, to create a DRG, which is a diagnosis related grouping that is submitted on a claim. And what, and what is a DRG? How did, is there a, did sure. you pick that? Does a computer pick it? How's that? Yeah, so the DRG is generated. So a DRG is diagnosis related grouping. To better understand what a DRG is, uh, think of a, an everything pizza, right? You have the dough, you got the sauce, you got the cheese, you got the mushrooms, peppers, onions, the bacon, pepper, all that good stuff, right? Well, the DRG is that pizza. It's the all encompassing of all the ingredients that were created. So these diagnosis codes, when combined together, create a DRG, which is then fired and triggered by the system to go out on the door and claim. And, and um, is the charge that goes from Ultralims to Edna based on that DRG? The charge is based upon the DRG. So to be very clear, when Ultralims is submitting a charge for $69,621, that's not for just complex regional pain syndrome, is it? Uh, no, sir. Based upon what I'm seeing here, there's multiple services that were rendered. And because of the type of service room and board, I would imagine that was part of the charges as well. In fact, when I looked at the hospital bills that we had submitted on behalf of All Children's Hospital, the vast majority of the charges were actually room and board, respiratory therapy, physical therapy, and occupational therapy. Okay. We're going to leave that there on direct because that's kind of the crux of it is the argument being made by the hospital at this point in time is that the charge themselves, when you look at the line items, right, the line items, you can see it here. So you see there's uh, all these different things in the line item charges that are being relayed are these individual charge accounts, these charge codes for room and board. Um, and they're all under, there's like one charge code there for complex regional pain syndrome. But this is direct. And it was a good point. It was a good point to make that a lot of the actual line item charges, and if you think about it this way, a lot of those line item charges would exist whether she was admitted for CRPS or for some other malady or affliction. If it was room and board, it would exist no matter what the diagnosis was, right? That line item, that charge, that cost would be the same if it was another diagnosis. Now, Mr. Whitney makes some headway on this in, in his argument and his cross-examination. But the point of this is to basically say, look, you've got these charge codes and they're being reimbursed. And yes, it's under the header of CRPS, but they would exist nonetheless. Okay, so let's see if we can't get to Mr. Whitney's cross-examination. Through 20 plus years in healthcare finance, insurance. If you can see a little bit. Uh, so let's go back. Um, there we go. $30,000 for a complex. The vast majority of charges. Fair warning, I am going to fanboy. It is going to happen. Mr. Whitney and I have extremely similar styles of cross-examination. I get frustrated when Mr. Anderson cross-examines. I get frustrated when Mr. Shapiro cross-examines. Mr. Hunter is like a maybe compromise. Um, Ms. Crowell's I think does pretty well at cross, but I don't think she's as direct or quick. I'm gonna fanboy during this cross. We, yes, I have a lawyer crush. I do. This isn't my first trial having a lawyer crush, but I don't know why we have held him back. Why have we held him back? Just saying. Mr. Anderson, this, this case is close to you. I recognize that, but why have we, why have we held him back? The closest thing on the defense side to this type of cross-examination might be Hunter, but Hunter for me is a little too aggressive. Mr. Shapiro is a little too condescending. Ms. Crowell's doesn't get to the point fast enough and isn't firm enough in her cross. So that's the, that's my analysis of all of them. Anderson takes too long, Hunter too aggressive, Shapiro too sarcastic, Crowell's not aggressive enough. If this was like the, uh, what's the, the goalie, goalie locks? In my opinion, Mr. Whitney, just right. Just right. Morning. Looks at the clock too. See that? 
Before, Before we start talking about the bills, I just wanted to make sure I understand, understood. I left Hughes out intentionally. Correctly. Sorry. And uh, you and I had a moment to speak outside the presence of the jury, so I won't try to rehash the whole thing. But am I correct that you worked for, you've worked in the field for approximately 22 years? I've worked in healthcare finance for approximately 22 years. Right. And during, you've, although you've been with several different hospital systems or health systems during those 22 years, you have worked never for an insurance company. Is that true? That's correct. And so as you sit here today, for example, if we put up exhibit 2017741, and similar to the documents you were just shown by defense counsel, we'll just select one here. You've never been involved in the creation of an insurance record like the one before you. That's correct. All of your experience is drawn from the hospital side and submitting bills to the insurance companies. All my experience has been on the provider side, sir. Provider side, excuse me. Sorry. Your testimony, however, is that the hospital bills bear a one-to-one -one relationship, a mere relationship with these documents, correct? My testimony is that I've reviewed the hospital claims and based upon what I've seen here, there appears to be a match in what we have <coughs> predicted what this document is providing. All right, so the jury can rely on the fact As someone who crosses like Whitney, this is my favorite. I love when a witness starts taking my questions and not answering them directly. Then I can get combative and a little argumentative. This now becomes fair game. I will treat you respectfully if you answer my questions respectfully. I will not be aggressive with you if you answer my questions respectfully. And you actually answer the call of the question. But if you start evading the question, I'm going to start poking. That looking at these Aetna documents, these are based upon the bills that Johns Hopkins submitted to Aetna. I wouldn't make that leap, sir. I didn't create this report. What I'm telling you is that the information that we submit on claims, Aetna's pulling this information from somewhere off of the claims we had submitted to them. Can you or can you not testify to the validity of these bills? I can testify. Well, these are not bills, sir, but I can testify to the validity Thank of you, the bills Jack. that we had sent to Aetna. And I can also intelligently explain what this stuff, uh, what, you know, a lot of these items are talking about here on the screen. All right. I wish I could have too. Looking at this, I'm sorry, you don't call this a bill. What do you call this? It looks like a, some form of transaction report, sir. All right. Looking at this transaction, transaction report, you agree with me that this, particular one is from December 6th, 2016. That is the date that it was received, sir. So I would, I'm, are you asking for when it received uh, the bill or are you talking about the services or the date of the services being rendered? The date that Aetna received the bill from Johns Hopkins Ultra Hospital. 12-6, 2016. All right. And I know, you, I know you focused with defense counsel on a couple of bills that were for room and board. This one says type of service hospital and ciller. You didn't focus on any of those with him. Would you please explain what hospital ancillary is? Well, it's hospital ancillary, and it's ancillary services are typically any services are provided on a patient for a multitude of factors that are taking place. So if you look here, the ancillary care involves uh, complex regional pain syndrome, job neglect, candidal esophagitis, and specified protein, calorie, malnutrition. What you see on the diagnosis codes here, sir, all these services and these diagnosis codes were individual services provided to that patient. So we, there are multitude of services that are rendered on that patient to generate the charges submitted. We're talking about medical services here. That is correct, sir. Right. And you, folk, you testified earlier that the top diagnostic code is the focal point of that bill, correct? The top diagnostic top diagnosis code is typically where a lot of the work is being focused on at that point in time of care. And although you're not a medical bill or a co or coder, but you oversee them. That's correct, sir. Right? You're aware that certain diagnostic codes carry a higher reimbursement rate than others. That's correct, sir. All right. So, for example, something like complex regional pain syndrome carries a higher reimbursement rate than, let's say, constipation. I wouldn't agree with that, sir. You would? I would not agree with that because the reason is the DRG that was submitted to Aetna for the hospital claims. Whitney's getting pissed. That wasn't the call of the question. He's now expounding. All right. Let's see how he does. That we sent through. There was no specific reimbursement for the DRG. It actually triggered a per diem reimbursement model that we had with Aetna at that point in time. Whitney is the pen clicker. 
He's the pen clicker. This dude and I share the same brain. When I argue cases, pen is always in the right hand. I don't click it, but it's always in the right hand. But you can tell Whitney, he's when he's trying to temper himself, he does that. He does the pen click. Oh, God. Now I get it. Now I get it. Now I get when you hear frustration or when, you, when you're not hearing someone expressing frustration, that's his outlet. So I'm not sitting there and say that CRPS would generate increase, decrease, or remain neutral any DRG because a DRG consists of multiple services that are provided, not just one. You'd agree with me that complex regional pain syndrome is the focal point of this bill on December 6th? I would agree that complex regional pain syndrome is the top line in this. All so right. Sir. And you've described the top line as the focal point earlier, right? You're not backing off that testimony, are you? No, sir. All right. Now, charge submitted $18,000 and then amount paid just over $10,000, again, for services. Uh, deliver um, bills delivered in December 2016 with the focal point being complex regional pain syndrome just over ten thousand dollars correct there was also appears to be 12 other services that were rented my question was is complex regional pain syndrome the focal point of this bill where ten thousand dollars was paid I can tell you the complex regional pain syndrome is part of what we had submitted for the are process. you backing off your testimony about the top line being a focal point train him I think he has so you can continue Okay. Are you backing off your testimony that the top line of the bill is the focal point? No, sir. All right. So you'd agree with me that as December 2016, the focal point of this $10,000 that Johns Hopkins received was complex regional pain syndrome. It appears to be, sir. All right. Now, you talked a lot about how Aetna never challenged the billing and paid for all the billing. I have. Yes, sir. All right. When Aetna communicates with someone like yourself inside the hospital system, how do they cross-check whether the diagnoses are valid or invalid? So for this instance, we had, there's a utilization management department inside the insurance company, and we have a utilization case management department and inpatient financial clearance teams. They work in conjunction to make sure that the services that we're going to provide are authorized to be performed. And during that period of time, Ready? there is communication or sometimes medical requests for information to maintain the authorization or to keep the care, you know, to, to make sure that the approved treatment plan is going forward. Once the authorizations are completed and continue to send, and like I stated earlier, then from October through January, the first week of January, there was 14 correspondences mm -hmm. between Aetna asking for medical review or medical documents and All Children's Hospital that we provided. Once all those bill, once all that has been taken into consideration, we then send a bill uh, to the insurance company to be adjudicated. If what we send does not line up with what is authorized, there will be a denial for a no authorization or a medical necessity. Sir. All right. Thank you for the explanation. In substantiating the billing, you provide the medical record. <laughs> Thank you for the explanation. Bless your heart. Oh, Mr. Whitney, can we have a beer? <laughs> can we have a beer? <laughs> like, just please, please. It's on occasion. As requested, sir. As requested by Edna. And here, 14 different occasions. They yeah, it appeared about every week, sir. And the documentation we provide with the medical records. That's correct, sir. Right. So, and what the insurance company is looking for is to see if the diagnosis that you're submitting bills for is actually present in the medical records. They're making sure that it's. Right. So, if a diagnosis that the hospital doesn't believe in is still carried forward in the medical records beyond the point that they believe that to be a diagnosis, Insurance company doesn't know the difference, do they? I can't honestly answer that question, sir. I don't know why, what you can you ask it again. Sure, let me ask it a different way. Yeah. If you have physicians that came in here and testified that as of November 7th, they didn't believe complex regional pain syndrome was a diagnosis, insurance company doesn't know that, do they? I I don't know. I don't handle the, the, the mindset of the, of the that, that doctor keeps a diagnosis in the record. Insurance company looks says it's still in the record. They don't actually interview the doctor and say, You would believe this. Well, I would disagree with you because, and here's why, there, it's not uncommon for insurance companies to sit there and ask for a peer-to-peer -peer review with medical providers to ensure that the care is being done. That does happen. Can you, can, in, in submitting these bills, can you just guess? Can you just guess at the diagnosis? No, sir. So if an anesthesiologist came in here and when he's asked, does this child have complex regional pain syndrome or not? And the response is, what do you mean? Is that valid? 
Objection, mischaracterization of evidence. Overruled. Ask your question again, please, sir. If the anesthesiologist on the case doesn't mm -hmm. even know if complex regional pain syndrome is a valid diagnosis or not, is this a valid bill? If the, <laughs> if the anesthesiologist, their job is to perform the services that is rendered or asked of them, and they will document that into the note, and then the coder will come in and provide the, the diagnosis code related behind it. So the difference is that you need to understand, and I think it's, is that the services rendered would be captured by the coders, and that the fact that the coders are a separate entity from the providers. If it's in the record and it's documented and it's captured, right. they will code accordingly for it. Right. So if you have an anesthesiologist who doesn't know what the diagnosis is, testify to that, but put it down in the record, it's properly coded as far as the insurance company is concerned because when they look at the medical record, there it is. You still have had to perform the services to treat. You're aware in your various roles that as a hospital, when you send out bills to the insurance company, those create financial obligations, not just for the insurance company, but for the patient and their family, right? Depending on the insurance plan they have, yes, sir. Majority depending on, well, may I explain? Is it true or not that in certain instances- He can finish his answer. Go ahead. The reason why it's important to understand is because it depends on if there's secondary insurance or not and who that secondary insurance is. So that's why it matters because in instances where we bill insurance companies for it, if there's a secondary insurance and depending on who that secondary insurance is, the ability to bill the patient afterwards may not be allowed. Let me ask you this way. Have you looked to see what kind of financial obligation the hospital's billing for complex regional pain syndrome as the focal point, even as late as December and January, created for the Kowalski family? I have not, I'm not aware of any. You can't speak to that, right? That's correct, sir. All right, no further questions this time. So, Mr. Baker, I think, just to be clear, when All Children's is sending a bill that includes a diagnosis of CRPS among the diagnostic related group to Aetna, before Aetna pays that, they're checking or requesting records to see did All Children's provide medically necessary services for that code? Is that right? That is correct, sir. So, if the jury has heard testimony from experts that the treatment for CRPS is physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy, what Aetna is doing before they pay their bills when they request the records is to see, did all children's provide those services in relation to the code? Is that right? That's correct, sir. And in your review of the entire months of my estate, did Aetna ever reject those bills for CRPS? We have not received any denials for medical necessity or authorization that I'm not seeing. And even to this day, in 2023, years later. Um, Dean Novo, thank you for the note. It's been great to, a great road to 200. Thanks for sharing your passion, brains, humor, and empathy. You're one of the good ones from bed breaking to Captain Corey to Secret McSquirrel. So with Daddy Stack, here's to another 200,000 subscribers. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm backing up. I just saw that come across screen. Of the entire months of my estate, did Edna ever reject those bills for CRPS? We have not received any denials for medical necessity or authorization that I'm uh, and even to this day, in 2023, years later, um, <clears throat> that's still true. They, that, it still has not. I am not aware of them recouping. For those of you interested in trial practice, right? So attorneys have different styles, very different styles. Some attorneys focus a lot on their, they script their questions. Some attorneys go not off of script, but they kind of have an outline in their head. Some of them write the outline and go off questions. I'm an outline and question guy. So I, I outline where I'm going and I will make notes of certain exhibits I need to get to. Courtrooms are a dynamic thing. You need to not feel interrupted quite a lot. The thing I like to liken this to is you ever been in a church and and this I don't mean to make it in this remark, but um, if you're in a church and a baby starts crying, if you look at the pastor, you can tell what kind of pastor it is or, or what kind of church it is based on how the pastor responds. If the pastor just ignores and keeps going, doesn't get affected. If the pastor makes a joke in passing, um, if the pastor makes a uh, kind of gets stammered up, those are different types of personalities. It's public delivery, public speech. Every person's a little bit different. Mr. Shapiro is, he's more organized in his 
cross. I think this is where he gets in trouble. His cross is methodically planned out beforehand, which means that when he's going into these this cross examination, if there's a prior ruling, he can wade into waters that might get him in trouble, as we've kind of seen. It also kind of indicates to me that he can get thrown by certain questions or interruptions in his questioning. Okay, so I want you to watch the screen again because Mr. Hunter approaches him with a note and listen and watch how his questioning gets thrown off. Now, I like methodical thinkers. I love the people that, that script it because cross, you have to be organized. But it does throw Mr. Shapiro for a second. The treatment for CRPS is physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. What Aetna is doing before they pay their bills when they're requesting records is to see did all children provide those services in relation to the code? Is that right? That's correct, sir. And in your review of the entire months of my estate, did Edna ever reject those bills for CRPS? We have not received any denials for medical necessity or authorization that I'm that I've not seen. And even to this day, in 2023, years later, um, <clears throat> that's still true. They, Edna still has not. I am not aware of them recouping any dollars for any uh, services rendered. And from your review of the bills, did you see whether, I, I know you said the copay zero, do you know if Mr. Kowalski ever paid anything? I am not aware of any patient obligation or anything that has been paid. No other questions? One more question. Hmm? Were you aware that the Johns Hopkins expert that came in here to testify about CRPS, complex renal pain syndrome, testified that my never had that condition? Sir, I'm not aware of anything that has taken place prior to me being here today. Leaves the dagger in. Leaves the dagger in. Oh. Leaves the dagger in. Because all of that was, I mean, this was, I, the direct was great for the hospital. The direct was great for the hospital because when the direct was going forward, I'm sitting here and, and walking through this and going, this makes a lot of sense. This makes a lot of sense. This makes a lot of sense. Then when Whitney starts crossing, I'm going, oh, we're just ignoring like the header, like the, the top. And okay, I'm starting to make sense some more. And then Whitney, with that last question, was, were you aware that that it's been denied that she had CRPS? Like that there was testimony in this trial that she does not have it. Which is just that question where the answer itself doesn't, it doesn't drive a point home. But what it does is make, it, it leaves the question out there for the jury to answer. Beautiful end to cross-examination. Great end to a cross-examination of just leaving a question that you know Everyone knows the answer to. And having the witness who just is not and cannot be aware of what's about to happen, that witness is, is they're sequestered. They have no idea what the answer to that question means. But everyone else in the room does. Everyone else in the room does. It was a, that is how you end a cross. That is how you end a cross. Because... It was, oh, people are saying they missed the dagger. They missed the dagger. Oh, Rob is now, no, I, I've been a Whitney fanboy. I mean, I, I have liked his style of cross a lot. He gets, a, a, I like his argument. I like, I like the newer, faster paced. You guys, I talk quick. I talk fast. People get frustrated that I talk fast. I do this in court too. So the quick, repeated, rapid fire um, thought, one thought to the next, boom, 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 boom. This is also how I do in court. Same demeanor. So, I, yeah, I have, that's how I practice. Let me do this because people said they missed that last question. When they request the records is to see. Did all children's provide those services in relation to the code? Is that right? That's correct, sir. And in your review of the entire months of my estate, did Edna ever reject those bills for CRPS? We have not received any denials for medical necessity or authorization that, I'm, that I've not seen. And even to this day, in 2023, years later, um, <clears throat> that's still true. They, Edna still has not. 
I am not aware of them recouping any dollars or any uh, services from them. And from your review of the bills, did you see whether uh, any set of copies is there? Do you know if Mr. Polsky ever paid anything? I am not aware of any patient obligation or anything that has been paid. No other questions? One more question. Were you aware that the Johns Hopkins expert that came in here to testify about CRPS, complex renal pain syndrome, testified that Maya never had that condition? Sure, I'm not aware of anything that has taken place prior to me being here today. Did you hear it that time? Did you hear it that time? All of these things about the, the primary billing code and how a lot of these services are being offered under CRPS. And he comes back in with that last question. Are you aware? And he says, no, but everyone else in the room is. That's why it's a beautiful cross. That's why this is the best cross because this witness cannot hurt you with that moment. You have left them with a question where the only answer to that question is one that you know absolutely is a yes or a no, and that you know that their answer cannot hurt you. It leaves the question lingering, and only the other people in the room know the answer to that damn question. Oh, that was so great. That was my favorite. I love that. I love that moment because it was well played. I want to catch up on questions before we get to the jury questions themselves. Elf Liggins, can you get Runkle for Monday's review with BD? I am very careful about who I bring into this particular trial stream, um, mostly because I, I like to time moments of levity when I feel like the moment's appropriate, and I don't call it the litigator in me about the little bit of control issues. But there's a lot of people in chat. There's a lot of people watching this who either suffer from CRPS or have children who are afflicted with chronic pain or, or, or who are medical providers or who have had involvement with CPS. And I'm really sensitive about that just because I litigate that style and I litigate in those courtrooms. So I try to maintain control and I try to keep this to a one person thing with limited exceptions for people that I trust. Ian is one of those that I trust. Kathy Beatty is going to be uh, frustrating to watch and I'm nervous about what it's going to be. Let me tell you this. It's a long with an answer. Get to the answer, Rob. Why are you dodging? You're not, that's terrible. Let me watch Kathy Beatty's testimony. If it is an appropriate level of spicy, I'll extend the invite. If it's something that actually deserves commentary, like down that regard, I can extend the invite. But I, I try to be kind of sensitive to this stuff. And I like people that support. And Ian was great last night giving support. Great last night giving support. He's one of my best friends. Polly Claire, do you think the defense has missed the point of the case? It's the only way I can make sense of their witnesses who aren't helping them. It's where my head is going. I think that they, they have lost the forest through the trees. Canonical Heat uh, uh, and Hug, the hardest working mods on YouTube. Yes, guys, my mods have pulled freaking overtime times 9 million. Um, I usually do a single stream on Fridays, occasionally on Wednesday nights. I have covered this case, this trial for like, what, 27 or 20 different episodes? It's every night. It's late at night. They have families that they attend to and love and care for them. And their family's probably going, where, where are you? Where are you? I'm moderating a live stream. Thank you to the mods. You guys have done amazing work. And thank you for keeping chat on topic um, and doing amazing things in the chat. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. I couldn't do this stream without you guys. 1974 chick. Uh, Sally Smith, exculpatory evidence, a factor in her arguments. I had an issue with that. I talked about it yesterday with Ian about some of the things that she left out that I had a problem with. Okay, the fact that she didn't get substantial therapy makes the hospital negligent to me if they believe she was being abused. Thoughts on that? The three hours of therapy is something that's lingering to me. It's, it's standing out there as a question they have not answered that 
I'm frustrated with every answer they've given me. The only answer that we have so far is that the timing just has not worked. That's the answer we have so far. The timing has not worked. And for me, the witness from this morning was five hours that I did in two weeks. Why is there 87 days and they have three hours logged of cognitive behavioral therapy? And this witness from the morning said that the psychological therapy is a massive element that you have to do continuously, almost intensively. So physical therapy, I get being at the forefront of the treatment. But again, all of these things are within the confines of the standard of care for this condition or for these conditions. Inquiry of mine, please explain 403 and 39 numbers being mentioned. Try to do this quickly. Chapter 39 is immunity that is extended to government entities engaging in a governmental purpose in the course of investigating potential child abuse, abandonment, or neglect. It's extended to the Department of Children and Families. The Department of Children and Families has a contractor with whom they work closely, which is the Child, Protect, uh, child Protection Team. Child Protection Team has an extension of that immunity. Think of it as a contractor for a police department that has the immunity of police authority. That immunity protects individuals that are engaging lawfully in accordance with those actions that are delegated to them by statute or by the delegating authority, the executive uh, executive branch or the executive administrative agency that has the authority to make that delegation. Department of Children and Families can hire people to do investigation. Those people they hire are protected. So the hospital is saying that a lot of the conduct that they engaged in should be protected by Chapter 39 immunity. The judge has said there's a question as to whether the hospital was acting lawfully in accordance with the authority that was granted on limited occasions via the Department of Children and Families and the court, or whether they extended that reach, and they should therefore be held liable for that extension beyond what they were allowed to do. 403 is a rule of evidence, rule 403. Rule 401 defines what relevant material is. Relevant is relevant material, relevant evidence is anything that either tends to prove or disprove an element of the case. Anything can be considered relevant. However, rule 403 exists because it basically says that where something is considered relevant, even though it might be considered relevant, the prejudicial effect of having that heard by the jury outweighs any relevance that information might have. Hearing something repeatedly over and over again or hearing something that's so significant um, can have such a detrimental impact while the relevance, the probative value, how much it adds to whether the jury is going to decide one way or the other is low, right? So the higher you get in the prejudice thing, how much it hurts, how bad it is, and the lower you get in the relevance threshold, that's rule 403. 403 says that where it's really prejudicial but not very relevant, we don't let it in. I hope that it helped. Ashley King, as, a, as far as trial strategy, would you have Maya attend Beatty's testimony Monday to show emotional distress or have her sit it out? No, sit out. I don't want her there. Nope, I don't want her there. I, I don't care. It's not about the image for me. For, for me, it's not about the image. And I don't think Mr. Anderson's about that either. It's about your client. You're protecting your client. And you don't want your client... If you can avoid it, if you can avoid it, you don't want your client having to go through a lot of that stuff again. Plus, the perception can be viewed in either way. So, if I can avoid it, I'm not going to have her there. Caitlin Fletcher, I've been thinking about this for a while. Is Chapter 39 immunity in all states? Yes, because it's an extension of the sovereign. It is the sovereign power. It's like the police power of the state, which is immune. The police in states are immune when acting in lawful compliance with the authority bestowed upon them, right? That immunity extends to other government functions and other government actions. So, the state has an interest in having a police authority or an authority that goes and investigates allegations of child abuse, abandonment, and neglect because the children, they're minors. So that immunity exists for a very good reason. But it can be used in certain instances as a shield that is frustrating at times. More importantly, if the immune, if immune, then how did son 
Coast and Sally Smith get sued and then have to settle. I'm probably just confused. Sally Smith and Suncoast got sued and they didn't have to settle. They chose to settle. Settlement is a choice. They can go to trial, but there's a risk at going to trial. They could have tried to rely on that defense or tried to persuade a jury they should be protected by that defense, but they chose not to, which is oftentimes a wise choice when you have dollar figures of this amount being contemplated. Sally Smith and Suncoast settled for a lot of the reasons why state police or uh, city police agencies or, or uh, city police departments will settle or the city will settle in those cases of officers who engage in conduct that's questionable, right? The city will settle. A county will settle. Similar, similar argument, similar understanding. Pepper Jelly, you said not med mal. Does fraud not fall under that since they use CRPS as a diagnosis for billing the whole time? No, that is a separate independent count. Pokes holes in the idea they didn't think she had it. It did. Mr. Whitney just brought that to the forefront. The Chuggy Show Live, I joined late. Is there an FNF stream tonight? There is not. I'm doing my uh, recap and that is it for this evening. Happenings at Lamgo Farms. If the jury is split, is it a mistrial or does the defense win? It is not a verdict in favor of the plaintiff. So the defense wins. The plaintiff failed to meet their burden. They failed to prove it. The defense wins. Uh, Alita Lee, please explain rebuttal for the plaintiff without time. Plaintiffs have, I think, two hours and 40 minutes, two hours and 20 minutes, something like that remaining, something like that. That is the time they have left in their entire case. That is both cross-examination of witnesses that the defense intends to call and in presenting a rebuttal case, which means that the rebuttal case has to be streamlined. Mr. Anderson cannot do direct in the rebuttal case. If you only have one hour left to present your case to the jury in rebuttal, you need to have an attorney that moves through that information quickly. Because at that point in time, it's not about emotional impact as much as it is about information that you're refuting. Getting those statements on the record, getting those statements in front of the jury. No, that's not true. Yes, that was true. No, that's not true. Yes, that was true. Yes, but a caveat. No, but a caveat. Okay, get that in front of the jury. Trust them to assess the credibility of your witness. Emma Daisy, if they thought it was conversion disorder, which I can't fathom how it gets that serious, why then did they put her in the EEG room for malingering? There are two different diagnoses. Thank you. I have trouble with this because the witness that testified to the decision to place Maya in the EEG room, I think it was Tepa Sanchez. Tepa Sanchez. I think it was Tepa Sanchez. Um, I might be recalling incorrectly, but the witness that testified to placing her in the EEG room said there was a proper purpose to doing so, that it was in furtherance of her treatment. But during cross-examination, I think that just got shredded. If it's in furtherance of her treatment, but then everything about the facts that lead up to being, her being put in that room looks like it's investigation, what are you to believe? I mean, and then I get that. I also go back to Mr. Hunter's opening statement, which included in the course of conduct the hospital engaged in, which Mr. Hunter said was proper. He threw that word investigation in multiple times. An investigation is not, not, that is, that is chapter 39. That is chapter 39. The hospital does not have independent authority to conduct investigations. They do not. People have been debating this with me, left, right, and center. They do not have independent authority to investigate. Wild Sage, can the jurors' notes that don't go back to deliberate go to those that do to use? Nope. Those notes are theirs. They cannot go back. They have to, they have to rely on their independent recollection. Uh, Esme, who do you think crushed it today? I think the defense did. Ms. Pete, congrats on 200K. Do you think Sally Smith hurt credibility with DCF yesterday with her proffer? I think it did. Anna, love your commentary of lawyer styles, i.e. Whitney. Would you consider a stream breaking down your favorite lawyer tactics and styles from different cases you've covered? I think I might. I might. It would be. It would take some time to put together a bunch of information about that. Uh, Laura Leanning, to our C hearts to our CRPS and chronic pain warriors in chat tonight. We recognize it can be triggering law and lumber team. Thank you, Lori Anning. Julia, 543, congrats on 200K. 
Sparkle Farts Forever. Heather, thank you. Congrats on 200K. Well earned. Your streams always teach me something and have been a great distraction at the moment. Sorry I missed yesterday, but I was at my mom's funeral. I'm very sorry to hear that. I'm very sorry to hear about her passing. I hope that you're okay and your family is doing okay. So I missed the stream. That's not something you have to apologize for. I'm sorry that you're going through that. Remember the good thoughts. There's a lot of them. Uh, Creed, real answer to that is Jay Hatch was telling the dependency court in transcripts they can't provide the treatment and the court refused to transfer. That hasn't been presented. Whether it's because of the rulings or not, I don't know. Uh, Tufts, Tragos had a similar reaction to the Sally Smith lack of um, exclus exclusionary evidence. I imagine every lawyer was cringing at that. Just Sarah says, Jay Hatch explained why any diagnosis would require 87 days in hospital. Did I miss that? Jay Hatch doesn't have to. Jay Hatch does not have to. That is the court. The court is responsible for the 87 days. That has been made clear in a jury instruction. The court cannot be held. The court, Jay Hatch cannot be held responsible for the duration of her confinement, for the duration of her shelter. They cannot be held responsible for that. That is up to the judge. That is up to the court. Okay. That's been clear. Lynn, 2574. In my opinion, Sally Smith ignoring six medical opinions because she didn't like them was not acting in accordance with the power of her position. I 1000% agree. Now, I'm going to play a quick little bumper because we're going to get to our favorite part, our very favorite part of trial coverage, which is, hang on, let me get here, come on. Um, there was a question from one of the jurors. You can do this. You know how to do this. You remember. Hey, Mr. Banquet, there's several questions, but before. There's several questions. Who are the questions from? The court has said our favorite thing. Bring the jury. Bring the jury. Bring the jury. The the jury has been brought. Do you want to say it out loud? <laughs> Congratulations on 200K. Thank you, Emily. Thank bring you. Bring the jury. <laughs> oh, you have to say bring this jury. I can do that. Hang on. Wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> hang on. I, 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 I got to make you big for this. You have to say bring this jury. Bring this jury. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing okay. Sorry doing to interrupt. Right. You, you didn't. You didn't. We're good. We're getting the jury questions and then we have a spicy argument, but that's where we're going to wrap for the day. I love so a spicy I'm glad argument. You're here. I can't imagine doing trial, and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot, where the jury questions are a thing. Dude, like, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's not just a thing. It's they They terrifying. have used... They have used 54 notepads, 54 notepads. Oh my God. This is a jury that is very deeply invested. They're paying attention. They're invested. Oh, you, you're, you're going to enjoy these questions, by the way. I, I can't imagine what this is like because your trial strategy is not your own because there may be something you're sidestepping as an attorney or something you're kind of like, maybe the other side will bring it up. But when the jury brings it up, you can't like slam the other side for bringing it up because the jury's brought it up. It's, well, it's, it's, it changes your trial strategy. Well, and that's the point that I've been making from the beginning of coverage of this was the lawyers are clearly dodging questions, right? They don't know the answer and they're avoiding it and they're scared and they're avoiding it. And here, like from the very <laughs> first day of trial, the very first day of trial, both lawyers were clearly dodging an area that this therapist wanted to testify to. Like you could see her and the jury. The very first question was, did you did you have this this feeling about Maya? And she, you see her just like and then openly testify. And I was like, OK, OK. Interesting. I wonder if it's something because it's so civil is so wild and that you have so much information going in with depositions in criminal trials. A lot of the time you're going in fairly cold with a lot of witnesses and you've maybe had time to talk to them, maybe haven't had time to talk to them, at least in larger jurisdictions. 
you've maybe got police reports that they spoke to somebody. You maybe have their name in a police report and nothing else. So you don't always know what people are going to say. So you have to get real comfortable with like, I don't know what you're going to say, but we need to ask the question anyway and go where we go. But in civil, you have all those depositions. So if that area wasn't asked about in deposition, I can see lawyers avoiding it because they're not used to asking what's not known because it is generally not great trial practice in civil to ask questions you don't know the answer to. The now, jury's not afraid. I don't know that you've been, so you haven't been covering this because you had your own stuff to cover, but there's there's a channel on the YouTubes that I have been endorsing who's remarkably respectful about a lot of this stuff, has been remarkable to my chat, his and my chat overlap remarkably. It's Recovery Addict. He applied for and received authorization to have the Zoom feed. So he has both the live feed and he's been live streaming the live feed, but he has the Zoom feed as a backup. When they have certain sidebars discussing jury questions, when they excuse the jury, sometimes court TV will mute the feed. Right. But he has the Zoom feed. Now, he doesn't broadcast it because that would be impermissible and illegal. But what he does is he holds his phone up to his ear and he repeats what's being said, which is reporting. Does that not count as broadcasting? I just have questions. Nope. That's reporting. That is like live tweeting. Which You're is like, allowed. There's no not, gag order. Not broadcasting. So we've <laughs> had we've had a little bit of insight into some of the disagreements and the defense right now. They they have issues with a few of these jurors. That's what Vaudier is for, friends. I sent something to yours in my group chat with several others today that was basically <laughs> saying whoever conducted Vaudier of this jury allowing law enforcement and former medical was either a genius or is going to be fired. We're going to see how that's going to go. The thing is, you can't tell people, you can tell people they can't come in with biases. Like, can you listen with an open mind? But you don't erase people's experience, life experience, knowledge, training. You don't erase that. And they bring it into the jury room. Oh my God. I'm so glad to hear for this. You Okay. I'm not, we're not going to belabor this. You have to hear these questions. Okay. I can't wait. Also, um, I brought the whiskey. We drink it. So we're also Good. here with because it's that time of year with the pumpkin pie whiskey. I hope my chat's not clocking how how this bottle's been traveling down the bottle. But we've got the pumpkin pie. The pumpkin. Well, pie. you clearly enjoy it, so it's so good. It's and so it's Friday inspiring. night, and I'm done with band, and now I get to be here and say hi to you and congratulate you on 200 gay and hear some jury questions and spicy arguments. I don't Thanks. know how I feel about the the image that they're using for the mic off mic on um yeah i it can be it it can be yeah i'm glad they're giving the attorneys a heads up so we don't have a, a lane your mic thing but um it's an interesting it's interesting yep so were these questions or that um there was a question from one of the jurors about the medical bills and um I just forgot what I was going to say. Do you want me to remind you? Yes, please. Um, that, um, the attorneys are working on the uh, submissions to the jury, which uh, should hopefully include the relevant medical bills. There we go. And why I couldn't remember that just 10 seconds previous, I don't know. Now, Mr. Baker, these questions are from the jury. Can you tell us, if you know, the interval criteria that Utilization Review uses for CRPS? I cannot tell you the interval specific to CRPS. What I can tell you is the submission between October and January, there was 14 requests from Aetna for us to fill for that, to provide the medical, uh, uh, to provide medical records to them for the services that we were rendering. But I, as far as individually for CRPS, no, sir. 14 requests? And if you know, can you tell us the interval criteria, that utilization criteria- It gets better. Uh, used for conversion disorder? Uh, once again, the criteria for a, speci a specific disorder is dependent upon how long the authorization is good for. Okay, so when we are, for some services that we have to render as a provider, we have to get authorization from the insurance company to be able to perform before we can even perform the services. Okay, and so the authorization. Oh, sorry, pause game. To be able to perform the I'm services trying not to do that. has to take place for a period of time and that authorization only lasts for so long before you have to go back and ask again to continue that level of care. 
All right. His testimony, remarkably technical. He was using terms I didn't effing understand. It was remarkably technical testimony about medical billing, insurance authorizations, pre-authorizations, and how we're doing it. The argument being presented by the defense at this point in time is that J. Hatch, Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, J. Hatch for short, J. Hatch was receiving payment not for CRPS treatment, which they said wasn't the diagnosis, but instead for room and board, which was under the subcategory. Yes, I get it. Yes, it's a very technical argument. So he's making the argument and he's doing these authorization codes and this stuff. So a lot of words, very, very technical. And I'm going, my brain right now is fried. I Medical hate billing is of this so type. squirrely. Medical billing is so squirrely. And for anyone in the international audience watching this and is like, why do Americans hate their medical system? It's medical billing is so bananas. Um, my, my oldest was in the NICU. And when we were going through all of the medical billing stuff and mind you my husband's a doctor like when we were going through the medical billing stuff i'm just like what is any of this the hospital that we were there where we were was lovely our insurance was great but it was still very difficult to navigate um all the medical billing stuff it's really hard it's really hard so i'm not surprised that this is thick testimony oh yeah just hold that for the next round I'm sorry. It's the wording. It's the wording? Yeah. That's the joke. Just talking to the judge. You got the wording wrong. Q U A L? Yeah, interqual. Interqual. Yeah. I apologize. <laughs> oh. Um, excuse me, Your Honor. You did not read that correctly. Can you please? Start over. <laughs> uh, that juror from Jules is in the Jules is in the chat. Jules is also in the court every single day and has actually been holding herself out remarkably, remarkably well and professional in her reporting and commentary. Um, that juror is juror number six, and interqual was not a comment or acronym or word that had been used in any of the testimony at all none oh so there's your medical person at least oh, one yeah. medical person somebody yep. who not just like medically adjacent because a lot of doctors don't understand medical billing someone who understands medical billing like that's that's a deeper level of knowledge yep now our witness does i our witness has a little moment that's interesting so uh, can you tell us the interqual criteria, that utilization criteria they use for conversion disorder? That's yeah, I cannot. The case management or utilization management team would be able to answer that question. But me personally, I cannot. I'm not He's looking person. directly at the juror. No. Did he just wink? Did he just wink? Did he just wink at the juror? Rob. 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 I told you you'd like that part. He winked. He winked at the juror. He winked at the juror. Rob, whose witness is this? Is this a defense, defense witness? Oh, God. Sir, why? That was like the weirdest I see you wink ever. Because you have no idea how your testimony is being perceived or how your demeanor is being perceived. You have not interacted with any person on this jury in any capacity. If I am if I am the attorney with this witness, I am just yelling inside can, loudly. Can we watch it again? And can you make a bumper of it? Like, can we cut this? Like, I feel so <laughs> uncomfortable making a bumper of it. That's fair. You still have to practice. <laughs> And why I couldn't remember that just 10 seconds previous, I don't know. Now, Mr. Baker, these questions are from the jury. So here's, you here's, how you, you know here's how you pronounce it the first time. The interval criteria that utilization review oh, no, uses it's not interval. for interval. CRPS. Interval. I cannot tell you the interval specific to CRPS. Oh, he said CRPS. it. He said interval. What I can tell you is the submission between October and January, there was 14 requests 
from Aetna for us to fill for that, to provide the medical, uh, uh, to provide medical records to them for the services that we were rendering. But uh, as far as individually for CRPS, no, sir. Um, again, if you know, can you tell us the interval criteria, the utilization criteria uh, used for conversion disorder? Uh, once again, the criteria for a, speci a specific disorder is dependent upon how long the authorization is good for. Okay, so when we are, for some services that we have to render as a provider, we have to get authorization from the insurance company to be uh -huh. able to perform before we can even perform those services. Okay, and so the authorization to be able to perform those services has to take place for a period of time, and that authorization only lasts for so long before you have to go back and ask again to continue that level of care. Just hold that for the next round. I'm sorry? It's the wording. It's the wording? Sorry. Because the judge said hold that for the next one. Enter yep. call. I apologize. So he knows. Uh, can you he tell us like, the inter oh, you know. criteria that utilization criteria they use for conversion disorder? That's I cannot. The case management utilization management team would be able to answer that question. But me personally, I cannot. I'm not a case manager by trade. Okay. Now, good question. The next question, again, if you know, can you tell wait, us the wait, criteria wait, for it unspecified was a link, child uh, like, maltreatment? Good question. It was a link and a and a good question. Like mm -hmm. it was like one step short of like. Oh, but you know what? God, you know what? So I I left I left my audience with the question that was given on cross at, to end the cross examination. They went through all of this, and Mr. Whitney gets up and delivers what is one of my favorite closes to a cross examination. Where is you ask a question where there is only an answer yes or no. There cannot be any exp expansion, and the, the question that is answered is something the witness cannot suspect impacting the case one way or the other because they haven't heard anything else but that everyone else in the courtroom knows the answer to like uh what was the legally blonde they oh god where's the legally blonde tie and i need to know everything she doesn't legally blonde where they call the hairstylist up or they call somebody else up about the perm and it's chutney. like the question that no one else has heard yes chutney they're asking chutney, chutney. about the perm because if chutney had gotten a perm earlier in the day Chutney could not be in the shower when the gunshot went off, because if Chutney yeah. was in the shower, then her curls would have been destroyed. However, this also assumes, and this is my problem with that soliloquy and Legally Blonde, though I, I appreciate good writing and I love how Reese Witherspoon delivers it. However, it is assuming that Chutney sitting on the stand is close in time to when this happened because Reese Witherspoon says to Chutney on the stand and your curls are still intact. But murder cases take go to trial like two years after the event. It's not like yes. the murder happened, yes. she wasn't in the shower and her curls are still intact. Like a subsequent intervening perm could have happened. But anyway. Correct. But you you ask a question that everyone in the gallery already knows the answer to. Yes. But this witness does not. and doesn't know how that impacts the case. And they answer yes. it and you just leave them there. So the witness is like, okay, what do and I just do? That's the same thing with this jury question. The juror just asked the question. That was left the hanging. Goes, the witness goes, no, I don't know the answer to that, but good question. The juror was asking the question because the juror wanted to hear that he did not know the answer to that. Right. Specifically. Because it was left hanging. Like, tell me again that you don't know. Mm -hmm. The chat knows. The chat knows the answer is ammon ammonium triglocolate. Thyglocolate, yes. thyglocolate, something like that. Can you read that again, Your Honor, please? Blinking slowly. You know, can you tell us the criteria for unspecified child maltreatment confirmed? Uh, unfortunately, that, that falls along the lines of a professional or certified coder, and I do not have that certification. There would have to be documentation in the record to call that out for the coder to be able to come in and, and classify that diagnosis. You're not a coder. You're just their expert in medical billing. Uh, is this correct? Mm -hmm. The coder will place the primary diagnosis first? The amount of care that is provided, okay, to trigger what is going on the most, that will automatically move up to the top. So whatever is the focal point of care at that point in time uh, will have a tendency to rise to the top. It's also, I think, very important to understand that 
did he a just lot of say times when the focal point of care as in if crps is at the top that was the focal point of care don't worry mr whitney's coming back it starts out as the focal point of care when a patient comes in through our doors doesn't end up being the focal point of care at a later point in time we have the we have a common practice it is common practice in healthcare that when a patient comes to our facility that outside physicians or outside providers who are rendering care give us you know some form of background some form of information of services that they're providing for this patient or treatment that's being done and that's usually what we start out with and that's usually what starts out with in the care of the patient because of the expertise of that outside provider or the feedback that we get from that patient but as they stay continues that can obviously change in terms of what's being treated can you describe to the jury what a drg is yes sir the drg stands for diagnosis that is outside knowledge that is outside knowledge unknown to anybody else that is this person who has specific medical coding knowledge who is asking a witness to define an acronym that is on an exhibit that they will later review holy crap well the lawyers obviously didn't fill in that gap or they just really want him to say it whoever voir this jury missed that somebody had a whole lot of medical knowledge related. but, but yes. rob hold on what happens and it goes yeah. back to the pizza could the defense have thought someone with deep medical knowledge is going to empathize yes. with the hospital and how difficult this is right yep. somebody I with medical knowledge isn't going to want the hospital isn't going to want to hold medical providers so responsible for something that happens outside of the hospital and might empathize with they were trying. They might have misread the room on that because the facts of their case are awful, but there is a deep legal argument in this case that they thought maybe somebody with technical knowledge would appreciate the deeply legal part of it. Well, it's it's the force. So I, I started my stream tonight with like kind of like a little monologue. It's the force through the trees. The entire case, right? Um, from the plaintiff's perspective is that they misdiagnosed, they mistreated, and they did these incidents, like five specific incidents of conduct that they allege are false imprisonment, battery, et cetera, right? And that these incidents is what was also emotional, intentional infliction of emotional distress that led to Beata Kowalski taking her own life. But the hospital came in and the hospital focused so intently on we did not misdiagnose. In Mr. Hunter's opening statement, he said the hospital acted within the reasonable uh, standards of care which was, and he lists them off. He says, um, diagnose, care, treat, investigate. And, and I was like, no, 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 that, that one, that, that, that little I word, that's, that's not in there. But their entire focus has been on ketamine. And I think that, yes, if you're going into this thinking that you have this viewpoint of, medical child abuse and that that's the foundation of your argument and if you're saying that if i have someone who's who has medical experience on the jury and they hear the quantities of ketamine that i am describing they are going to instantly they're going to be like oh my gosh this is ridiculous but i at the beginning of the stream i said i don't think this case is about that anymore i am sitting here longer and longer as the trial goes on and going if i concede every argument the hospital is making if i concede that the mom engaged in behavior that was well in excess of any reasonable medical bounds. If the child came in and was diagnosed with either CRPS or conversion disorder or factitious disorder on another, AKA Munchausen by proxy, how does the hospital get me over these specific five incidents of conduct? But right. they're so focused on the med mal. Right. Sorry. The med mal is definitely the trees. Yeah, I digressed. No, they're in the weeds. But I get, but this is, the, this is the difficult thing, again, about complex litigation, is when you get too close to it, you can get too close to it for a jury as well. And, and so here's something you didn't know. Mr. Hunter Mr. and Hunter. half of this legal team were the attorneys of record for the hospital in the removal proceeding, in the dependency action. Oh, they've been in this for that, a really long time. 
that's my assessment. My thing, yeah. my thought process is they are still back there. They cannot, they have not, they can't separate that. Right. Which but, is not always what's best for their client, the hospital. Yeah. It's an analogy that I provided. There's multiple diagnoses that are provided for that patient during their care for that period of time. Okay. And when you bundle them all together, they're individual diagnoses, but when you bundle them all together, it triggers what is classified as the DRG or diagnosis related grouping. What that means is, Hey, all these services that you rendered fall in line in treating this type of particular uh, illness or this kind of particular malady. Okay. And so that DRG is then submitted on the hospital side through to the insurance companies to go through the reimbursement process. Following that question, is that bundle payment for a specific diagnosis? That bundle payment is not. Wait, for a specific wait, wait. The juror just used the word bundle before he dis The juror knew what the Did answer was going to be. The juror is now setting up their own cross-examination. They're like springing traps. It's what is happening? I told you, Emily, this is, it's this jury. This is now this jury. They are this jury from here to the end of time. You know what? I, I, I love that they're this engaged in this case and asking the questions they feel need to be answered. They're like, la, 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 we're going to ask the questions and figure it out ourselves. Like you're going to put this case on us and we need to figure it out. And they are taking it yep. seriously. They are not glazed over at this testimony. and a lot of juries do glaze over with expert testimony and they're engaged. I mean, I, I think I would love serving as a juror in this way because as a juror, being able to ask questions would keep you so much more engaged in the process. You're not just a passive observer. You're actually, you know, on the field with everybody else as part of this process. So I have a theory about this. I have two phrases in cross-examination or in questioning that I hate. They are triggering phrases to me. One is what, if any. I'm, I'm also triggered. Another one is, are you telling this jury? You know what Mr. Shapiro's favorite phrase during cross-examination was for the first 10 witnesses? Not what if any. Are you telling this jury? So the jury started referring themselves as this, this jury. jury. That's funny. All right. So are they going to come in with have, shirts that say this jury? I want, I'm going to make a shirt that says this jury. You're damn right. I'm going to make a shirt that says this jury. Okay. Anyone's I'm going to bring you. Jury. Sorry. We need to keep going. Spicy argument. Spicy you. argument. I promise you spicy argument. Um, you ever, you ever see a lawyer get really close to sanctions? Yeah. Of course you have. <laughs> I practiced in criminal law. I did have a judge once tell me that I might need to go back to my office later in the day and get my checkbook. Um, so I've also been that smile? lawyer. What? Was it because of your face? Yes, it the was smile. because of my face. It was because of my face. Um, I also stormed out of court. It was juvenile court to be fair, but I stormed out of court once and slammed the door like a petulant child. Um, I was wondering where that would go, but the judge backed down. So cheers. Mm -hmm. I was right. We're going to, you know. Yep. Yep. So uh, that's what we've got. So we have an argument now over a prescription they want to introduce. And I have been talking to the chat a lot today about 403, rule 403, where the information is while relevant, the prejudice and the prejudicial effect of hearing that information well exceeds the probative value of that. And this goes in line with the ketamine. The hospital is very much ketamine, 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 drugs, drugs, drugs. At some point, you can't keep doing it. Like you're, you've exceeded that, that authority. So they want to bring in a pharmacist about a year prior uh, and testify to different prescriptions. And I did not forget about Uncivil. I know he's live right now. Uh, this is where we're going to end it with this particular argument. Through the remainder. Through 22? 22, Hang on. Let me boost my volume because the court feed is the court feed. It's in Dr. Hanna's medical record. It's not one of those blank ones that we talked earlier about for Patrick. It's an agreement that he signed and is in the record. All right, we need Mr. Hunter. We believe we uh, the IV ones. Are the not chat's very excited about what's coming. Normal saline and Zofran and Hydroport that you want. Say it one more time. The chat's very excited about something about Hunter. 
So oh, that's what, that we're, what we're doing. Oh yeah. Okay. Was giving intravenous fluid. I don't have any questions about that. But if you look down at the ketamine, judge that, uh, it's on, on the first page of this exhibit, the two lines, three lines up from the bottom, the, the two are ketamine, and it, the, the prescription is frequency as needed, and then the route is oral. Now, what, what Mr. Anderson just made reference to is the fact that if you get ketamine, it comes as one solution. The solution can be IV, IM, or oral. But this prescription is for oral. And that, that, and that was the only thing that was going to be adduced. The, the, um, the point that was going to be made, that I hope to make with this exhibit, is simply that it verifies that the hydromorphone and the PCA pump were in fact filled, and then it had been my intention to approach the bench or the remainder of it regarding the ketamine. And, the other, and for that matter, the other IV uh, matters. They're not, they're not disputing the oral ketamine, Judge. And it's, I, I have no problem with oral ketamine. Okay. I, for, for some of the reasons I expressed yesterday, I, I remain very concerned about this discussion about IV. And because I do feel that there's a big 403 issue. I'm trying to. Well, do you want us to remove intravenous? Bianca Kowalski was an IV nurse. And right. there are allegations, but no information to substantiate the allegation that she was giving intravenous ketamine via infusion at the house. To, right. Outside of a medical setting to her daughter. That it, it's been thrown out there. And the judge is like, I can't let this in if you don't have anything to back it up. Correct. And the prescription is not for intravenous drugs. Yeah. Uh, if, if the court's going to admit this, um, it seems the defense's stated purpose is specifically for the hydromorphone, which is at the top of the screen there. So we would ask for the remainder to be redacted and they can reference yeah. the hydromorphone. There's two prescriptions there for that two week period in November. But even then, what is the relevance here of whether for the trip to Mexico she got hydromorphone? I, I, we failed, the plaintiff side, we failed to understand, but unless you're getting into 403 or 404 bad acts, I guess, uh, what, what relevance is it to the Anderson. issue for the jury, whether on the trip to Mexico, she, Maya had um, hydromorphone available? Judge, these are prescriptions that Maya was given. It goes towards how much medication she was needing, how she was doing, the fact that she's getting oral ketamine at home, which has already been testified to by the plaintiffs, how much she was getting, because they stood up here and showed a chart to the to the jury, here's when she was getting her infusions. Well, in between those infusions, she was getting oral ketamine at home. And I think that's relevant for perspective for how she was doing. We're not trying to imply that she was getting intravenous ketamine. And I agree, the oral ketamine, I have no problem with the okay. oral ketamine. Okay. That, it's everything else in this document and how is it going to be used Ooh. my bigger concern. Yep. Well, yep. I, 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 I yep. just. Oh, do you want to prove intravenous? I don't know what I want. I just know given the years of concern I've had I about. This, fucking stop is what I want. I want Judge you to Carol fucking stop. Used I want to you work. to fucking stop is what I want. You can hear him go. I, 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 I. So Judge Carroll used to work for that attorney. The white haired lady. Uh, there is a Mr. Alton Byrne on the uh, defense side who's a retired, uh, a retired Second Circuit Florida Court of Appeals judge after sitting 25 years on the he's he's making the he's doing the jury instruction stuff. This judge, people have said he's he's been a pushover, sided one way. No, he pushes back. This is a pushback. This definitely feels like a pushback. It feels like um, it feels like he's been pushed too far on this particular topic. This does not feel like a new uh, topic that's being broached. But also, mm -hmm. a retired circuit judge is now also on the defense team. <laughs> it's really interesting. This judge is not clearly an older, older judge. Um, so it's interesting when older attorneys try to push the judge around with their experience, oh, yeah. you get eventually these clapbacks. Sometimes judges, uh, very judiciously pick their battles. Um, but you can tell from his body language that he is done with this entirely. Yep. Entirely he walks done. off the bench. He walks off the bench, comes back and it's like nothing happened. The jury comes in, they come in, he's pleasant. There's nothing afoot. This guy was built to be a judge. 
I was not. The chat keeps asking me. I, Occasionally, it's like, wouldn't you no. want to be a judge? No. 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 Imagine, I can't, Emily would throw shit at the parties. Yeah, I would. I Yeah, I would be a terror. I No, I don't have. There's a judicial temperament that is lacking. Yes. For me. Yes. I, I My face betrays me. Yeah. Yep. Number of times we've talked about I, I am very wary about this subject, and for, for the reasons I expressed yesterday, I remain very hypersensitive about this issue. Okay. And it seems to me that we also, since there's already been testimony that the oral ketamine and that she was taking it in 2015, it, it also seems to be, we're trying to continue to prove an issue that well, is not a dispute. Well, except the amount she's getting, and the, the, this is oral ketamine in March of 16, in April of 16, there are different months that she's getting prescriptions there's, for oral ketamine. There's a pattern of oral ketamine judge that extends across the period of time that plaintiffs have been contending that she was doing quite well and she was a freight train headed to college even and, and was not needing ketamine treatments. And during that same period of time, these, these prescriptions indicate that she was, in fact, getting oral ketamine boosters, that her mother was, in fact, giving her that. Now, the, the, the IV portion of this is not in dispute. There's already been testimony from Dr. Kirkpatrick that he prescribed IV normal this saline to be given to this patient by her mother through her port PRN. That that ship has sailed. This documents that it was sailing farther farther out into the sea. There's nothing to be done with it other than the fact that there it is. It's being done. The only thing this is for is again 403 Bad Act 39 stuff, and that they're trying to uh, argue that she was being given what too much ketamine or too little ketamine or that the ketamine was helping her get better or wasn't getting better. I don't see those, Your Honor, uh, respect to counsel, as probative of anything in this case. And if it is, it's cumulative to all the other stuff. And, and our concern, frankly, is that through testimony of the next witness and skilled questioning, this is going to turn into a Chapter 39, 403 issue. I just... Did all of this freeze or did I freeze? Now I'm confused. <laughs> giving her too much, too many drugs. And that's somehow probative of Beata being a bad person. I, I, I don't understand any other way this could come out. And even if there is a superficial reason for doing it, to me, we know how, how the initial description of the evidence somehow ends up coming back around. Well, I still maintain that it is fine and not any sort of violation of the court's prior orders that the discussion and evidence relating to the oral ketamine that Maya Kowalski either did or did not take prior to 2016 is relevant uh, and admissible in this trial. Okay. So perhaps what we do is we leave in the ketamine um, items and then just redact the balance of the document. Because it seems like we want the ketamine, and I'm fine with the ketamine. You can either have just the ketamine and the rest of the script gone. You can right. Those two items or nothing else. Or. And what about the hydro concept? Well, that, that is exactly where they started out going on this, which is to say. I, I, either you get the script. We got the script. Either you get the script and we redact the hydromorphone off of this one, or we leave the hydromorphone in this one and you don't get the script. Oh, that's right. I mean, I understand. Which is it? I'm trying to understand the choice. Well, okay. so, you, 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 you see, you, 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 you want to understand. Stop ways. now. What's, what's Same the same information. You, your Honor is correct. All right, here we go. So, so we're going to give some good and was like, "That's like that's fair," but I I understand. Because co-counsel, yep. why are, why is he then taking another bite at the apple after co-counsel had just wrapped up? Like, co-counsel's well, like, we're done here. So, Mr. Hunter is lead counsel. Mr. Hunter is lead counsel. He is the lead counsel. Now, I want to give him some grace here. He has a, uh, a pain condition of his own, his back. The judge has granted him leave to make arguments seated. So, he has significant back pain. Right. He's been medical issues so we're going to give him a little bit of grace but even with that grace man i want listen to this argument because he i've i have argued like it like this in front of a judge before i'm sure you have too you where you are like i'm gonna get my ass thrown in jail 
I had a, I had a, I had multiple colleagues, some defense attorneys, some DAs, taken back into lockup during court. I, I they weren't they weren't have... kept there, but they were escorted out of court. Sometimes court gets heated. Yep, my law partner would ask me when he when she knew when she knew that I was going for a case that was about that way. He would, Is that because you started pulling out your wallet and your phone and your car keys and putting them on counsel? No, it people? was it was she would ask me, "Did you get do you have a toothbrush?" And I was like. It's always my briefcase. Yep. Always my briefcase. Here's my phone. Here's my wallet. Just use my credit card for bail money. Yep. It's worth it. Yep. So I'm going to move the closed captions to the bottom so we can see this. I do want it both ways. And the reason is very clear. I do Dr. want it both Patrick ways. sat up there and testified that, yes, he wrote this prescription for the PCA and the, and the hydromorphone. Yes, he, it was necessary for him to do that because of the pain and because his treatment had not worked. But then he said it hadn't been filled. He testified that the prescription was not filled. The document that we're trying to use here, this document, Are they the exact same is one? a document from court. Let me give you a, let me give you a preview of the testimony they am getting in. This witness they put on the stand, he, when asked about the question of whether it was filled, you know what the witness says? Hmm. I can't tell you it was filled. I don't know. Oh. After all of this, nice pause game though. Look at that. Yeah, who's what's an argument that, that did not know if it had been filled? Yeah. So Wait, no. Who wants to make the point? Didn't know that it if it had been filled or not. Yep, he wants to spike the football and say this was filled because Dr. Kirkpatrick said it wasn't. Oh, and up. Dr. Court Patrick said, I don't know. No, Dr. Court Patrick was the plaintiff's uh, doctor. Who right. Said, he said, I don't, I can't. Filled. Said no, it was Dr. not filled. Says, it was not filled. He said, okay. I wrote the script. It was not filled. It was not filled. Okay. And they want to put this CVS pharmacist up to say it was. And they put him up. And the pharmacist says, I can't tell you if it was filled or not. Okay, so they are trying to get the gotcha moment a different way because they didn't prep the pharmacist that they brought in. Like they didn't have the pharmacist review records. They didn't bring in the whoever maintained the records to say on the records it shows it was filled. No? Okay, no. Okay. Okay. So the defense get, witness couldn't answer the question and they're trying to still get the answer in another way. And we we get we get angry. We get angry and this is one where i've been here but you can't act this way or around that the gentleman we're about to put on is going to testify documents among many other things that it was filled that he filled it that's the point and we threw fog right this morning your honor and so whatever dr kirkpatrick did in that regard is irrelevant not, it doesn't matter the february does not matter to this judge the point is can we let mr anderson finish his argument please yes uh, we have to look at what the impression this is supposed to make on the jury. It is one thing to stand up and say, well, we think it could be as to this, but the clear import is that uh, Kirkpatrick is either lying or giving medications or agreeing that ketamine doesn't work or I'm not sure what all else, none of which is pertinent to any issues here. Uh, if the court wants, to, and again, the court has been very clear about the ketamine orally coming in because they want to talk about dosing. Fine. But as to the remainder of this, all it can go to is either Fiat of Dad or Kirkpatrick Bad. It can't go to anything else. Yes, it can. Respectfully, Honor, yes, it can. It goes directly to the point of the extent of the child's disease. They're saying that we aggravated a pre-existing condition. They're saying that she had this condition that we made worse. This shows how bad that condition was, how bad it stayed, how bad it was refractory to this therapy that was going on. It goes directly to that issue. It starts with a hydromorphone. It goes right through all the ketamine. And at this point, I, I told you the, the ketamine, oral ketamine is fine. Uh, with respect to the uh, Zofran and the hydro, whatever, I, I, again, if you want this document, that's fine. But you're not getting the script as well. Okay. And so do so you want the pharmacy record? We need to, you know, redact out all this other stuff. Okay, can you be clear, Judge, on what you want us to redact? The items that are in the script, those items can stay on the pharmacy record. The ones that you're talking about, the hydromorphone, the zofran, the ketamine, 
that can stay. That's what you were talking about, right? Yes, I mean, no plan is for nausea. What is their point? You'll also see on here, Judge, there's a medication called Gamagard, that's IVIG, that's also the subject of testimony. It's not a surprise that that would be administered on the as well, pursuant to a order from Dr. Paul, who testified in front of this course rather early in plaintiff's correct. Again, this is designed to create the idea that Viata is giving all of these at home and then what? Somehow that's doing what? And all of these are prescribed and everyone knew what she was taking. And I had not yet heard an expert on their part come in and make the arguments, the technical arguments that they're making, that somehow this affected the degree of her disease or an indication of it. So I, to us, we cannot see where it doesn't either go uh, 30, uh, chapter 39 or 404 and irrelevant to the issues. I, I, I can honestly, I continue to, to struggle with how medications given in, two fifth, in 2015 impact <laughs> what the hospital did or didn't do. It's acts or omissions in October of 2016 and whether uh, the hospital exacerbated a condition that and the hospital says that doesn't exist. Um, how that is, in fact, uh, relevant, relevant when I compare it to the mm -hmm. substantial 403 issue that I, I know that is my out point. there Move on. Uh, that I've been struggling with since the first day I've been assigned to this case. And so I... Judge, he's there in 2016. He's been on this case for like four years. And she just he cut knows. him off. And he's like, this is the thing. This, what happened in 2015, isn't relevant to the allegations here. Stop it. Yep. And it, he's been on this case since 24. He has been on this case from the beginning. He has been here awesome. this entire time. There are 4,000 docket entries on this case. There are 50, uh, 54, 54. That's weird because I think it's 54. 54 summary judgment orders. Summary judgment orders. What? Yes. <laughs> That's not motions in that's not motions in limine. That's summary judgment orders. Oh no, yeah, no, no. Uh, okay. I'm so, I'm over it on his behalf. I mean, they've litigated and litigated and litigated and litigated and litigated. Wait, it's like, a fine stop. line. You gotta oh, walk, but you gotta walk the fine line. Like that's your job. At some point, that's your job. No, Rob, you've got to walk the dog. Maybe somebody should have told him that this is actually a novel about a Mexican prison. This is okay. not real life. Thank you for the levity. You're welcome. Enjoy the argument. This, the MSJ yes. orders, like I, I need Zofram. Like I can feel it rising up. Like that amount, mm -hmm. that amount of, of litigation mm -hmm. is just everything I never wanted to do. Um, oh, this is the same judge on the uh, Petito and Laundry case, by the way. Mm -hmm. I like I like this judge. From uh, this judge has been very thoughtful. From the other the other hearings I've watched in that case, um, is a tremendously thoughtful judge. Not all judges are, but oh, this no. judge I, spends a lot of time and energy thinking through all of the different avenues of how something can go, and that's not something you get from every judge. Oh yeah, I agree. I this appreciate this great one. Yep. He's also got so, like three monitors rocking. I don't see one. Sorry, say that one more time. He's got three monitors rocking. Like we, I love it. Like this is how I like to work too. He's like watching. Here's another one, like on the side. Like he's got four or three. Like he's he's good. Yeah. Let him he judge. can't work the lights in the courtroom. It's really funny. But oh, judges never try it. The amount of courtrooms I got called to for tech support, like for trial tech support, it's like the DA's office would page me. They're like, Miss Baker, can you go to division three? I'm like, I'm not needing division three. And I would get to division three and they're like, so we can't get the projector to come down. Yeah. Okay. Argument. One that uh, is after yeah, there's, there's one that was uh, what on October 7th. Are you talking about the ketamine specifically? Then? All yeah, of this I mean, is before all, no, all, all of this is before the, the hospitalization that we're talking about. But it's all leading up to the hospitalization. Judge, it goes to her condition and how much it was taking for her to be as she appears in the photograph. I'm about ready to just say nothing comes up, okay. honestly, because oh. it, everyone's arguing so much about this, which further makes it clear to me that uh, the, the purpose of this is not um, 
is, is different. The purpose of, let me just say this. I remain very concerned about the 403 issue. That is huge. And I know that's right out there. And I am concerned. Can you tell he was a trial attorney? Like six or seven weeks into this trial that we might- Random up in real quick. And, and I am, don't want to have that. And she's giving all of the- and I'm just- Let me pause really, it. Really, Her faces really, 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 are not good. Wait, wait, so, wait, 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 wait. I understand the court's order. Ruling at this point, the oral ketamine stays, the hydromorphone stays, and the Zofran stays, and everything else is fine. Why the Zofran? I mean, yesterday we did a lot of talk. It was the items that were on the script, the Dr. Hanna script, which is what they were trying to argue yesterday. I wasn't aware of the Zofran. Okay, so it's hydromorphone. Whatever's on that script. Ketamine's not on the script. That's just the hydromorphone. You can have the ketamine. Normal right? speed. I, I am okay. fine with the ketamine. All right. So we'll ketamine or the script. He keeps saying that. Perfect. So let's uh, show it to the defense before. You hear Hunter's sorry, sorry, side. The plans before it's shown. Okay. And if there's any further redactions, we'll address that. <laughs> so we just redact the entire entry medication. Oh, crap. It was like. Oh, he's going to go leave. Let's just leave. The arm touch was stop. That coke alcohol arm touch was like that. Please. That part, I missed that. I missed that in the first time I watched this. She's trying to tell him so, to stop. So Crawwells is the is the attorney in white. She tries to wave off Hunter, like leave it, leave it, mm -hmm. leave it. You're gonna get our ass sanctioned. You are going to get evidence kicked out. Stop. This this is also something that a lot of women know when you see your partner getting too hot over like a wrong order at a restaurant or something. Like I recognize the uh, like cal calm down or it's going to get bad. I've done this with friends too. Like it now is the time to deescalate or we all end up in jail. Like I, I, we, I understand that, that hand yeah. pat. We need to chill out, but. Cause she just, again, this is like the third time she's acquiesced to the ruling saying your honor, it's over our objection. It's, it's, I understand, but it's over our objection. She had wrapped this for like a third time saying it's over our objection, but we're accepting the ruling so we can move on. She yep. closed the door and he's not done fighting. Yes. And she tried to say, hey, now is the time we stop. Sorry. Yep, let's see, cause we're gonna watch the, uh, we're gonna watch the arm. All right, so we'll redact that. It's over objection, I understand. Done. And so done. let's and uh, done. show it to the defense before, sorry, show it to the plans before it's shown. And if there's any further redactions, we'll address that. And so we just redact the entire entry medication all the way through. Oh, he's going to go Let's just leave. Prior statement, we will be making objections to the Vos 2019 deposition they tend to play, and we'll have them to those to the court by the time we do today. We, we thought they were playing 2023. He's mind. tapping his pen on the desk. Okay. Well, I'm opposing counsel's on the record. I'm sorry? Uh, I'll be looking out for the further objections that I have to rule yeah, on. We also have served Dr. Wyndham. We're waiting for those to Side note, before you leave, remind me, I have to play you a very short clip about a, like 30 seconds long. So the individual behind Mr. Whitney there, Mr. Whitney's in the blue suit. That is Samantha Lawrence. Um, Samantha Lawrence passed the bar during this trial. And the okay. judge congratulated her. And I was making comments on stream that I want to see her introduce the lawyers. Two mm -hmm. days later, she gets up and says, Samantha Lawrence, for the plaintiffs, I'm here with my associates, Greg Anderson and Nick Whitney. And I died. So I've been highlighting every time she gets to speak in court because I tell people that this is a remarkable impact on young attorneys. And I have a clip of her. Don't let me don't let me let you leave before. Okay. That's but, let's watch Mr. Hunter get in trouble. That's what's funny. I don't think I've seen anything with Dr. Wyndham. We're waiting for them to tell us if they have any objections. Not for so like Dr. Wyndham, right? We're not in legally Dr. Wyndham was sent over yesterday evening, I believe. So we'll do that this week. Okay. Yeah. So just to be clear, Judge, 
Sorry. Oh shit. No, no. Mm-hmm. Just to be clear. Is that correct? Mr. Whitney. Dr. Byrne, we're ready. Okay. So what are we doing right when I bring in the jury? What's next? We're calling the pharmacist, Mr. Shaw. And we still are working on the Sam. redaction. We could so I'm, want to play Hannah. I'm going to show him the prescription so that he remembers the prescription. As I've told the lawyers, you can pretty much refresh recollection, but when we do it, let's not carry our script right next to the jury and, and wave it to the jury as we walk by the jury, which I think I've been always saying. I can truthfully tell the court that never crossed my mind. I, that's fine. I just wanted to remind so we don't do that. Ooh. <gasps> Mr. Hunter, please don't look at me like that. He's got like the Brooks mad dog, the judge face. Like this is, this is defendant Brooks's mad dog, the judge face. That's stunning from a member. It's, of the bar. it's the looking down and then back up. Like that was, I would, he is lucky. This judge has the temperament that he has there are about seven judges in Fairfax that would have hmm. get out of my courtroom. Uh, no, it would have been like, Hey, uh, get out of my courtroom, but this way, not that way. Yeah. Uh, one more time. As we walk by the jury, which I think I've been always saying he's offended. I can truthfully tell the court that never crossed. The my is offended. I, that's fine. I just wanted to remind. So we don't, do that. Ooh. Mr. Hunter, please don't look at me like that. I think they have it. Yikes. Side note, the walking up and the suggestion about what the contents of something that was not in evidence said has happened twice in have this trial the by the defense. The redaction yet? Look at Hunter breathing. He's pissed. But if if somebody on that defense team has done it, the court's right to say, you can't just be like, I've got this prescription right here. You can't do that. It it was it was an email. It was an email. Or it was a it was a it was a note by the GAL, and it was. Shapiro was up there at the witness stand and Shapiro held up and said, would it surprise you if you had a note that said this, the note was not in evidence and he actually misquoted the note, but he held up the piece of paper. And I gave the example to the chat. I was like, look in a bench trial, I will sit here with a notepad and I will say, are you sure you didn't send an email on this day that said this? completely bluffing but it's a bench trial i'm not implying to the jury correct that i have a document the judge knows better the judge knows if i have a document you'll see it i'm introducing the document right so that's what we had for today that was quite a look to the court trials do get heated um i appreciate the judge's composer composure in don't look at me like that. But he was acting like my honor is offended. But if his team has done that, it's right of the judge to remind, you know, you can refresh someone's recollection. We saw this in Deputy Heard when Elaine was trying to refresh recollection by reading out the entire thing that can't come in. Yes. That's not how that works. You hand it to the party and say, is your recollection refreshed? But they can't just recite the thing. And you had expert Don Hughes being like, so what, this is like a game of memory. I just look down and look up and my memory's refreshed. Like, no, that's not how no, that you can't, you can't do that. And the thing is, people always say, what's this rule? And the, the example I was using in law school was like, I can pick up anything. I can pick up Ziggy, my little unicorn. Does this refresh your recollection? Why? Yes. yes. Why? Yes, it does. Now I remember exactly what I'm testifying to. 
but you can't read off of it. Right. So, okay. Um, I'm okay. going to play you that little video and then I'm going to do super chats and get out of here and uh, call it a night. Cause I am still sick. Cause I've been you, doing, yeah, yeah, I was going to say you've been sick. You've been in trial. You've hit 200,000 subscribers. It's been busy. It's been busy. Just a bit. Just a bit. Just I a mean, bit. I've, I've, I've worked snack bar, so I've aged like three years, but yeah, um, that will do that to you. I'm really good at it though. I know. I told, I, I said the ADHD <laughs> brain works very was, well in that high demand job because you remember 9 million things at once. It's so much fun. It's why oh, I think yeah. it's why we all like streaming so much because you have so much input coming in at once and your brain just hums when you're processing that much input at once. It's not something I understood all the way, but my ADHD buddy and I in law school would sit in the back of the classroom, particularly during wills and trust and share headphones off of his laptop. And I would take notes and he would play a movie and we would be in wills and trust. And so both of us had a movie going and wills and trust. And I would take notes. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Your brain just needs more, your brain needs more stimulus. And so, um, jobs like that work well. So snack bar was like, snack bar was my jam. So before I do that, the chat has two questions for you. One, ask EDB about Sally Smith and the exculpatory evidence. Sally Smith, do you know from any familiar familiarity with her role? Right. So it was DCF contracted with CPT. She was, was the chief I watched medical some advisor. of the testimony and it was really confusing. I was like, what are you doing? It seemed like she was the one like steering the ship, but she's not a doctor. Like, or she is the she is, a doctor, she is but the she's not chief. the treating physician. She is the medical director of the child protection team. Now, the question I'm asking you doesn't require you to know a lot of facts. What she testified to yesterday was that her role as an investigator was not to present. The question was asked of her whether she considered any information from doctors that had contrary viewpoints. And she said, that's not my job. My job is to find the evidence of child abuse and present it. And I said, no. You're an investigator, ma'am. Your job is not to have an outcome determinative viewpoint. It is to have an open mind and then follow logical conclusions to the evidence. You don't go in saying, there's child abuse here. Let me support that conclusion. Because then you're just working off of confirmation bias. You have to consider all sides. And when you don't present the other side of the equation, for example, if not I were to show up on scene, time officer said, I found this guy with a gun, but he leaves out the fact that the gun was handed to him by somebody else. Yeah. That's not really an investigation. Oh. That's an allegation or an accusation. So. Yeah. I mean, if you go that, searching for child abuse in a medically we'll common child. Yeah. Find it. You're going to be able to find something if you try hard enough and you can manipulate things. That's done. Yeah but consider information from all parties. You have to, you have to, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's, I don't know. I worked as a criminal attorney. So the child abuse, um, that I saw, and hard, I dude. specifically tried to not work in any way with child abuse and it would still creep into my cases. Well, and I didn't I, want to be in any of those units. It, you didn't need to look for evidence. Yeah. And some people in the comments were pretty harsh on my criticism of this. They were like, well, do you have to find exculpatory? Do I have to say that this person is a good person? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that if something is looking you in the face in medical child abuse cases, and it's a conflicting viewpoint by a doctor, you have to at least listen right. to it and document it. Yeah. If your job is investigation, you have to investigate. And that yes. includes asking all parties. Correct. You've got to be curious. Yep. You can't be looking for an outcome. Like and it's not the, hard to be nosy. Just ask everybody. So this one is a request and I think it's for a, uh, someone wants to, someone wants to clip it. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to leave it up to you as to whether you want to say it or not. Sure. In recognition that I will damn well clip this, but I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you big. I mean, I've got my Halloween lights going, so we're, we're time stamped into the spooky season, but hopefully that's fine. All right, so the this would bring this jury. We have questions. Bring this jury. We have questions. 
God, I love it. That was perfect. Great. So we we're gonna have, have a all of the questions. I love this jury. They're so smart. They're fantastic. And the last question I had for you, and I'll, I'll pull it up later, but um, last question was the jury questions, whether we think that it's appropriate or not. I expressed hesitance or yeah, when, when the concept was first raised to me, but they do get sidebars and they get to argue evidentiary reasons for excluding the question and the judge excludes a lot. Well, because I the think, rules of evidence are a thing and the juries don't know that some of those questions might, the answers to the questions might be out of bounds. Yeah. So what's your thought on jury questions? So I'm super torn. Um, and I have different viewpoints, I think maybe between civil and criminal, but the fact that they get to discuss them and the jury understands that that's the process, like not all your questions will be able to be asked and they don't get offended by that. It seems to keep this jury engaged and in complex civil litigation, I think that's a plus to keep the jury engaged. Because if the jury is left with this resounding question and you didn't answer it as the attorney, and that's something that's crucial to them, but you might not have seen as crucial, wouldn't you rather have it answered? Absolutely. And wouldn't you rather have it answered by the person on the stand? Absolutely, because once they go deliberate, then it's, we can't answer that question. Evidence is closed, you have what you have. Um, in criminal cases, I think there's more room to get into really inappropriate questions that cannot be answered and you're dealing yep. with some different, um, you're dealing with some different rights. But I think, I mean, the jurisdictions who do this, obviously this is what they do. It doesn't come out of left field. So it's interesting, but I think for this case, it's keeping this jury engaged and helping them understand the case. Um, as a lawyer, would I like this? This terrifies me. Like oh, when yeah, you have a case plan, it it you could get into your head um very easily and try to interpret what they mean which you don't always do um properly because they could mean i mean we misinterpret humans all the time right and if you purposely don't ask something there's probably a reason so yeah so i don't i, I, mean, I, I agree. like it i'm torn but, but i see i see the benefit and what i really like is letting this is what I love about jurisdictions. You let each jurisdiction decide what's right for them. Yep. I love that. Matt Bond, who suffers from chronic pain, um, is in the chat. He's been here all the time. And the spiffy legal mumbo jumbo talkie friends. It's always been talkie brother from another mother. Uh, now it's talkie friends together. I legal, am mumbo, the legal jumbo. mumbo jumbo talkie friend. Um, yep. You are the legal mumbo jumbo talkie brother. And yep. now we are the legal mumbo jumbo talkie wonder twins. Yep. Uh, which is fantastic. <laughs> I will let you go because you have to film quick bits. I already filmed quick bits. Oh, look at you. I See, having a time constraint helped. Um, but I do have a child that has to be up very so early. You were, you were acting on the time constraint when I said you could pop by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was great. It worked out well. And that's why I poured whiskey for after because my face tends to get red. But I needed one. It's been a long, it's been a long fall. Um, I feel so bad because my my kids' high school's football team is like going on to finals and has been doing really well. And I'm like, it's not over yet. But today was a full day. The the chat knows today was a full day. Today was eyebrows, nails, hair. Because I love the hair. I'm the leaving. Hair Thank you. Next week I'm leaving for BravoCon. So I had to, we had to get zhuzhed. Um oh. there's lots of grooming that goes into BravoCon. I mean, less for me than for Bravo Lebs, but it's an it's an intense convention. Um, so I needed to start training. I couldn't I couldn't go in um, without a little bit of pre gaming because it's intense. Right. But it's in Vegas, and it looks like it looks like we're on the verge of a service employee strike in Vegas. The last oh, no. their deadline seems to be the day before i travel to vegas um and it seems that the service workers may walk out of the mgm owned caesar owned and win owned properties so um that's going to be real interesting and it seems that they might do that before the huge f1 race in vegas that is um not that long after BravoCon. So I think the service workers are going to shoot their shot because since the pandemic, the hotels have not hired adequately. So the service workers are being forced into overtime. Um, so I understand 
but uh, I'm I'm very nervous about what's gonna what's gonna happen. Well, I trust you with the Bravo stuff. I There's lots happening. Did you see Shannon Bedore's DUI? I DUI? saw a news headline. I did not look into any details about it. It the news headline should have said it was a point two three. Did you say that number right? I did. I did say that number right. It was a hit and run DUI at a point two three. And then Rob, have you heard all of this? She she hit a house. Thankfully, she did not hit a person. She did not injure anyone other than herself. She broke her own arm. But she hit a home and tried to drive away, but then couldn't really drive away because point two three. So got her dog out of the car because her dog was in the car and started pretending like she was walking her dog. Not like she had just um, collided with a home. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I I leave you to that. I'm dealing. I'm going to deal with with one complicated case at a time. That one's not complicated. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. But my brain has to navigate. Girardi's from, complicated. There's more going on with Girardi. Girardi's complicated. Yeah. Oh. Hey. The chat oh. is saying to show me the lawyer clip. The chat is like, clip. All right, here's clip. lawyer clip. Here's lawyer clip. clip. Here's lawyer clip. Ready? Wait, let me back it up. That is a dirty pause on the judge. I didn't mean to do that. Why did I do that? Why is that? Is that? That's the wrong clip. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> present video file. Where's Ms. Lawrence? Ms. Lawrence, we need you. Ms. Lawrence. Ms. Lawrence. Rob. The judge is calling for you. Ms. Lawrence, we need your attention, please. Did I tell you what happened at Vid Summit when no. I hung out with Legal Eagle? And he might, somebody at the dinner table mentioned Sweet James. Oh, God, I hate you. <laughs> I don't hate you. I, you know that I mean that. I know what you mean. You um, know what I mean. So I was like, now that Sweet James came up. Did you say Wood Daddy Stacks? I said, did you know that his ex was on Real Housewives? And then proceeded to talk about the fact that we trended on Twitter. It was amazing. It was a great conversation. It was really funny. I enjoyed it. Because everyone needs to know. That Wood Daddy Stacks was traded. I am Wood Daddy Stacks. Yep. But we also needed to talk about what the stacks were of. Um, yep. It was a great, it was a, it was a good, it was a good conversation. And it was one it of was, those it was like wonderful our conversation but also retail regaling the story of these stacks was like a a head scratcher because i'm like imagine having to go into court the day after your estranged spouse tells this story on national television emily like, imagine like having to go into court and recognize that any single person in the building that you're practicing law in recognizes like or, or knows what hashtag would daddy stacks is it's not negative towards you. It's just funny. I, I think it's a positive. I know. We're going to let Ian in to watch <gasps> Ms. Lawrence. Ian! Oh, this stream just got literally <laughs> Ian, longer. Ian, well, you're I home. Can't, I can't make this a mile long. I am I am wrapping this stream up. So oh, I'm going to let you watch I'm going to let you watch Ms. Lawrence, and I'll let you watch one thing. I'll let you watch Recovery Addict, which is a five-minute so thing, which is really funny. So Ms. Lawrence is positive. Here's Ms. Lawrence. Why don't we have, starting with the plaintiffs, uh, take appearances? Uh, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you. Ethan Shapiro, Pat Crowles, Howard Hunter, David Hughes, joined by Dr. Jenny Dolan. All right, this is coming back. This is coming back from break. Coming back from break, and there's no one else in the courtroom. Ms. Lawrence, you're in control. You, you're the only one at counsel table. <laughs> so that's the power. one video and then the other video is a fun one because recovery addict i've been following on this and he had he had something uh happen to his stream this morning that gave him concern and this will be its own independent video i'm giving it to recovery addict and i'm going to post it on my channel but it's a little it's it's kind of funny that for nine months so they can't believe okay stop, stop, stop. i need the uh, i need the southern for breeze Hey, can somebody bring me the raid? There's a bug. <laughs> There's a bug in my studio, and I don't want to uh, 
turn the camera on it because I'd have to zoom out so it would all fit in the camera lens. It just went behind the camera. <laughs> it's you guys. Oh my goodness! This this I will tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen is is this that that bug. And when I talk about bug, I'm talking. You know, it's it's, it's those they call them water bugs here in the south. No, they're cockroaches. You know what they are? Yeah, and they're not water <laughs> bugs. That was that was like you can't it drown was the size them. of a small dog. It's and a warning. That it's occasionally, a when we get one of these that come in the, inside from outside, and usually when the leaves when they fall down, they're they're around the leaves outside. But when they get Don't into the it. house, I have uh, I have words to say. And now it's it's literally it's crawling towards my green screen. Oh. So I'm going to be on camera like this, and then on the green screen, you're going to see a bug crawl across the wall. <laughs> that's what's going to no. happen, and it, and it no. will be mortifying. No, it will, that's terrible. Be so bad. Um, my family is ignoring me. They're playing the. Uh, the tuba in the other room, but nobody's bringing me the Southern Febreze, there which is bands? also known as Raid. There bands? Uh, you can get it in all yep. different scents. Um, but Southern Febreze is, uh, is a fantastic term. He's trying to swallow. You guys, this is... <laughs> <laughs> I might have to stop the show. No, you need to burn it was, down the house! It was house. right there. It was like within <laughs> arm's reach. Burning down the house. Oh, my goodness. We need an indoor cat that eats bugs. <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. Get the Raid. Get the Raid. You guys, this is this is literally. I have, no. I have a couple, a couple fears in life, and and one of them is definitely um, having one of these bugs By the way, look at his shirt. house and crawl across what my it green says, screen. It, it, it might be irrational, it might never happen, but if it does happen, I will never live it down. <laughs> and and that bug literally is like four feet from my green screen, and it was headed that direction. I need you guys to keep an eye out for it. It's a setup. <laughs> I need I need you guys to watch for it. Oh my goodness! Uh, my cats would have nothing raid. to do I with cockroaches. This is bad, guys. It's gonna be a bad day. I can't Wait, step on it because it's like it was like at waist level on the wall. This guy's got such go a way. great setup, and my setup. Right, so I'm Southern lovely. Febreze is ready. Um, here we have uh, not sponsored. Scented? Not sponsored, by the way. Uh, <laughs> yep. This is. Uh, uh, it looks like it, this is lavender it scent. Is lavender. <laughs> Southern Febreze. <laughs> We're gonna put that right where I normally keep my drink, and. Uh, Make sure oh, that's a fair drink are, on the road. I, I'm going to be looking like this that? until I find the thing. Oh, oh, it's, it's up. It's up high. Also, putting raid where you normally it's, keep it's your drink is a recipe for no, most don't, 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 don't you dare. Don't you dare. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm sorry. This Usually, we're a little more professional in the mornings than this. Um, we are, we're going to get... I, I can see it. it. It's above me, almost straight up. We have we have eleven foot ceilings in this house. It's an old house, right? We have eleven foot ceilings, and there's a picture rail that runs around about ten inches down off the ceiling, and it's above. It's between the picture rail and the ceiling, but it's like it is almost. Oh, it is an old me. house with a picture rail. And when you spray a bug a that high above you, I've learned from experience they fall. They fall. They fall. They, they fly, fall. and they aim for your eyes. This, this is how <laughs> <laughs> Angie. Please, nobody clip this. <laughs> I don't want to see this on Twitter we are professional. or anywhere else. If this appears on my green screen, it fell. It fell. <laughs> Streaming is so difficult. So help me, you guys. Okay. Um, it could be anywhere. It's it's now halfway. It's two feet from my green screen. It's now on the ledge that hangs over the top of the bookshelf. I've got eight oh foot God. bookshelves in oh here, God. and it's on the top ledge. Which hangs over my desk. I can I can touch the bookshelf. I'm not going to right now because there's a bug on it somewhere. And and the fact is I have to stand up. I have to stand up to Musical get this. Notes, happy and it's day. No Pants Friday, Coco. so I've, I've got all Wild sorts of chat. issues. It's No going Pants on. Dreaming ten ten. Problems. Can't go anywhere. You have to. Did you see it? All right, let the cat in. I, will cats eat these? Will cats eat these? <laughs> no, no that'll eat the cat. The the, this yeah, the cats sure. won't eat them. But the cat will run away and make you deal with it. It's not like they're wires. It'll win the fight with the cat. Um, yes, cats will eat them. No, we're keeping the cat. Cats will eat cockroaches. A little funny oh, that was there. quite the laugh. Oh, that was just me adding. I I just messed with that. I I threw that together before I went live. That's funny. Um, the TTYL is an interesting thing that a lot of streamers do. I don't think I could have audio chats coming in as I'm covering stuff. I I unless I was doing like if I was gaming streaming, I could because then you aren't reading the chat. You're gaming and you can respond to chat having the audio chats. But I I just I worry that somebody right would do something horrible with that. That's exactly what they would do. Generally, you have mods approving them, though. Okay. 
so it yeah, doesn't happen. That, but a lot of the that, streamers that montage, watch. I'm going to send that over to Recovery Addict and let him post That's that funny. first because that is that is gold. Funny. That is gold. That was this morning live. He was doing that. He was managing that while he was getting ready to cover He's like, Maya I'm Kowalski. I'm going to die. I'm going to die because there is a bug. <laughs> I, I feel you. Like I feel that. I get it. The I dropped my kid off the other day and we had both the car doors open and a bee flew into my car. I was oh. like, I'll walk. Like, I don't need to get back into this car, but I was standing in the parking lot just waiting for it to fly out. I was not so happy. I will have you know that Scott, who is the recovery addict, and recovery addict is is he recovers old artifacts and he has a past addiction to gaming and online. So he's got a really great chat, really great community, really great people. He focuses on community first and then like content follows community. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, he has ranked his uh, best hair of law tube. Uh, Peter Tragos is number one followed shortly by emily d baker and ian runkle and he switches off who is second and third <laughs> uh, i am nowhere on that list that's fair so, we do bring the hair you guys do bring the hair but... peter's hair is glorious <laughs> and so is ian's so i get it mine's just yeah, purple wonderful. I mean, other than that all right the purple okay, is awesome though i have to catch up on super chats and get out of here um no we're doing it together you can't get rid of us i feel you trying to get rid of us my whiskey's not gone yet okay we can do that together. i need a whiskey that's what i need here we you go do. Do I have a glass or do I just need the bottle? Uh, Bottle's bottle. fine. I think you need I think tonight's a from the bottle type of night. It it All might right. be. So congrats on 200 k I'm torn on M MBP, much has by proxy, and the pain my Kowalski has suffered. I work in healthcare, hits home for me. SS did overstep in record access. Could she be investigated by the board for her conduct? Nope. I think it's could be several years and she's safe. Hmm. They have a time limit on that. She's no longer in that role. Lame. So it's about as <laughs> much as you're going to get out of it, to be real. Is she retired or is she on to different roles? Different private practice. Hmm. Yeah, it's tough because for to get her out of private practice, she'd have to like do something that takes her license. Are there and pink chairs? Could we send her a pink chair? And a camera? No, no pink chairs. Not for her. <laughs> no chairs. I love how uh, we all know the story on that one. And it's so no terrible. One <laughs> has explained why they finally let her go home. Maya Kowalski. After Maya watching Kowalski part of this talk, can I explain what I think? What? This is the only impression I was left with. They got scared. That was the impression I've, I've been left with in this case. Of they which let her one? When, they, when the hospital scared. let her go? When the, when the juvenile court let her go? Yeah, when the hospital let her go. Yeah, I, I suspect it was the, it was the Pensy Court that made the hospital let her go. Yeah, she was under a shelter order. She was under a shelter order, so the juvenile court made the ruling after mom had passed. The juvenile court made the ruling. The ruling was retroactive to the original date of petition, which said there was no there was no child child abuse. So, and it might still be somebody got scared, and like. They're just like, be. I'm not signing my name to something horrible. But it's, it's honestly, it's the judge's call. And we're not, judges make good but calls, bad calls. We don't know. Her from the mother, if that was the original purpose of the petition. That's yeah. kind of what the allegation was. Yep. Uh, Emily, this is for you. Where can we get pumpkin pie whiskey? Not sponsored, but should be. Old Smoky Whiskey. Oh, you drink all of their stuff. I love all. I'm wearing my old smoky. They are local. I'm wearing my old smoky <laughs> sweatshirt that just happened to be what I was wearing today. Um, I would ask wherever you go to the liquor store if they carry old smoky or if they could get you some. I don't know if the old smoky website ships it. I have not tried because everywhere in Tennessee carries it because it is a Tennessee made whiskey. They also make yeah, yeah. they also make boozy spicy pickles, which if Runkle, whenever you make it to this part of the country, I I am going to have to make you try boozy spicy with uh pickles. They it won't there won't be a make. It'll just be we are going to do this because that um that sounds like an absolute win to me. Yep, yeah. it's just gonna like, happen. All right, Jennifer Johnson says, <laughs> Mr. Bankert, 
Mr. Bankert recognized, appreciated, and was impressed by the knowledge of the medical coding terminology from this juror, hence the wink. What the hell is Interqual? I agree. There was impression that he was impressed, but it was also one of those things where that juror knew what the question was. That was cross-examination. And that's Clint terrifying Nixon. if you're if you're counsel. I know. Like, that, oh crap. That, they know what, what we're talking about. Uh, I, what is this jury yeah, saying so, in that back room? The judge had a private dialogue where he muted Zoom, muted gallery, muted everybody with oh. attorneys at sidebar. And there was a lot of discussion, and I suspect it was about the jury. I'm there's been I think there's I think we're gonna see a motion coming. I don't know when. I don't know what it's gonna be about, but we'll see. Motion uh, to Vixen, who is one of Recovery Addicts mods, how can JH not be accountable for the shelter duration when the court orders were based off one-sided info presented from their investigative entity that cherry-picked info to present that eluded the child abuse? Here's the answer to that. The Court of Appeals said so. That's a good answer. That's the answer. I mean, it's a it's sad answer. answer. That's the answer. The The issue was argued. The judge had a view that Jay Hatch could be held responsible for some of these things. It got appealed up. Second, second Circuit Court of Appeals in Florida said no. 39, that's the limit. Can't do that. So we're walking the tightrope with this case. Steel City, I brought this up to clarify a point. Rob Court TV and other media are not the ones muting the sidebars. The judge is doing it. He specifically spoke about it in court. That's correct. That's correct. When the judge throws the white noise machine on, the Zoom feed does not have audio. When the judge instead just pulls people up to sidebar, Court TV or the judge mutes the national broadcast but leaves the Zoom feed open to those observers who are reporters or individuals that have an interest in documenting or commenting on the case. Recovery Addict is one of those individuals. He has access to the Zoom feed. He is not rebroadcasting. He is not displaying. He is listening in and telling you what he is hearing in court, which is the same as live tweeting, which is allowed. There's no gag order. First Amendment exists. And I've got to say... Um... If you remember from like the Virginia courthouse, yep. it them muting the Zoom feed when they hit turn on the white noise machine, the white, the white noise. That that is a gift. That is a charitable thing for you as the audience because, oh my God, that was loud. Like that was yep. actually painfully loud in that room. We're just sitting there like the white noise mm -hmm. machines are really loud. So we don't use Becky those McKean, here. If the jurors take notes, but can't take them to the jury room. I take notes. No, this is a misunderstanding of my prior answer. When there are six, there are six selected and six alternates. A prior question asked, can the alternates give their notepads to the ones that are going back? No. I said, no, <laughs> you cannot. No, you cannot. You are allowed to take notes of your own recollections, your own interpretations, your own memory of a six week trial. The judge lets you do it. You're allowed to take that back into deliberations. But other people can't give their thoughts, impressions, questions, etc., to you. That's improper influence on the jury. And some places won't like some jurisdictions. They let them take notes, but they won't let them take them into the jury room. Mm -hmm. And this then jurors get really upset take, with take that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Katz Grodick, I'm 99.9% .9 certain that juror number six is a nurse case manager based on these very direct, knowledgeable questions. I know this as I. And I too am a nurse case manager. We know DRGs and ICD-10 diagnoses codes. Very interesting. How that slipped by voir dire? Sure. The attorneys don't understand what other people do. In their yeah. Job. But the thing is, is if you don't understand. You have to ask. You've got to ask. You've got to like Google. Um, like we live in the era of the internet. Somebody says, yep. oh, my job is, you know, whatever. And you're just like, plug that into Google. What does this do? Don't they have <laughs> jurors' information in civil before they get no, to they do. here? Right? They do. They I, have I, teams this is, that run this, goes this back, shit. This goes back to what I was saying. I think that they thought they were going to get a favorable jury with that question. Uh, and that might Nicole be the thing is they might have thought, each side might have thought, oh, this juror is going to be great for us. 
And then later you go, ooh, regret. <laughs> Sometimes you strategize yep. wrong. <laughs> uh, Nicole has ADHD. So did she have CRPS or did you commit insurance fraud? Question. That is what the plaintiffs would like you to be thinking. Nicholas, thank you. Rob is so nice with his pauses, avoiding how people look bad. Me, I can make anyone on the stand look like a very inappropriate thing I'm not going to say out loud. <laughs> I just took a drink of my whiskey and it almost came back up. That was hilarious. Oh, yep. whiskey's a bad drink for that, too. Yeah, it I'm trying to be respectful with witnesses. I don't like hitting them with a the bad pause. I don't want people screen grabbing that. Uh, I have an accidental knack for always catching them at their like most ridiculous moment or most ridiculous look. I try I don't to do it on purpose. It just happens. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and I have observed that and I try to be respectful. Hero Dragon, the ethics committee member predicted maternal unaliving. They did nothing to prevent that. Florida medical and EMS is really pushing behind trauma informed. Okay. Jennifer Johnson, I believe Mr. Hunter was not feeling well. His back, yes, I did. I did make that comment. His back was hurting. He has grimacing in pain at 455.50, and he wears a uh, Spartanos lumbar support brace. Rob hmm. Squirrel on the Hunter's belt the other night. Yeah, I saw the brace the other night when I was watching the trial. I've made that comment. He's allowed to make arguments from a seated position. I recognize, and the judge has given him that ability. That's kind he of is still really choosing tough. to be there in court, and yep. you have to be respectful when you're there. So, yep. uh, Chesney, Michael, why has no one talked? Oh, my God. The number of terms I've learned in this trial. Give it a Pharma... shot. Pharmacokinetics. That was very good. Pharmacokinetics. Both sides now make do claims extra about judicial energy. four times. I was just thinking no, that. No, I. <laughs> that is, I can't <laughs> say that word, and you know I, I can't say it. There. <laughs> extra, 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 <laughs> extra judicial. It's Pharma, uh, I didn't... Uh, pharmacogenetics. Pharmacokinet. Oh. Pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics. Okay. Both sides make claims about ketamine, but leave it hanging. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a choice. Matt Bond, objection. Nah, ah. Fuck you mean, nah. -uh. <laughs> That's exactly what that uh, exchange was. <laughs> kind of. Yellow pill, uh, 17. In the U.S., providers who prescribe controlled substances like Dilaudid have access to database eForce where you can see what was filled when and where it was filled because you can't fill it early. One of the bits of testimony was that some of this stuff was filled. Others were not. Others were replaced by prescriptions. It was lower. That testimony didn't do a lot for me from the pharmacist. Mary Lynch, please talk about Hunter Glary, the judge. Oh, we did. Granted. We did. <laughs> Gil, sorry, why couldn't the defense get the new redacted form and the script in? Thank you. Because of Rule 403. We have argued about this, and I think this is a big point in this particular case. You can make the argument that there, were, there was sufficient information for the hospital to conclude that Maya presented not with CRPS, but instead with factitious disorder on another or Munchausen symptom, uh, syndrome by proxy. You can, you can reach that conclusion. The problem is, at some point in time, it becomes spiking the football. There's a rule in evidence that prevents spiking the football. Rule 403 is that rule, where information becomes more prejudicial than probative, meaning the harm it does versus the value it adds is vastly disproportionate to exclude it. That's why you couldn't get both in. I just saw the super chat that just came in. I just does the spike <laughs> the football analogy work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's one of the few sports ball references I'll get. So you can't just want it admitted because it might be relevant and it makes the other person look bad. There, it you can't do that. It has to help the jury. Yes. Uh, Noni Mac, what a great way to end a very long week. This CRPS warrior. Cheers to you, my dear. Is thrilled to see EDB. Congrats, Rob, on 200K. Also wanted to shout out Jules for her dedication to keeping all us lawners in the know. She has been very, very, and she's been very, very careful to abide by all of the court rules 
And I have, I have been appreciative of that fact. Matt Bond, welcome to the Unicorn Cave. I am uh, Jude Unicorn. I think he's referring to Judge Unicorn. Judge Unicorn is what I have uh, previously bestowed this judge, Judge Unicorn. Uh, Mary Coppola, the second script cancels out the first script and defense didn't know that answer. The defense assumed Beata was driving Maya. That's the backfire of the pharmacist. There were Thank questions you. that were asked that were not answered the way that he expected inquiring mind emily i love you insightful thank you amanda i went through a huge surgery the doctors made their notes that weren't true they apologized profusely because they know they messed up a lot mm. uh shall see thank you for the gifted memberships matt bond spiffy lego oh god Extrajudicial, Matt. Spiffy, legal mumbo jumbo, extrajudicial talkie brother. <laughs> don't, Matt, Matt, don't Matt, do it. Matt, don't do it. Don't do it. Matt and I have known don't each other it. on the internet do for it. a long time. Spiffy, legal mumbo jumbo talkie brother from another mother, and Spiffy, legal mumbo jumbo talkie sister from another mister. <laughs> this is you, Matt. ADKEMT, the ADHD trifecta. It is cheers to the ADHD uh, musketeers. Oh, cheers. <laughs> Trace okay, that Connery. needs birch. I'm scared <laughs> for him. Uh, I am too. Matt Bond, court is canceled. We are on bug watch. <laughs> I'm just picturing a scene from like, uh, what is it? Starship Troopers in there. Yes! Oh, God. <laughs> I'm here to do my part. <laughs> Magical Mary. Magical Mary, referring to the bug search. It was great. Last about 45 minutes. Oh, yeah, my God. A lot. RGMY. Thanks, uh, to you three, I got a late diagnosis of my double neurodivergency, no ADHD. So thank you so much. And congrats on 200K, Rob. Love your communities as well. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Lawn Nerd JM, Rob, you won best beard. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Holly P, please end the clip with his daughter confirming she got it. The bug? Got the bug? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. I, I can't. I got to go. I, I might go back and re-edit, but I'll see if I can't <laughs> figure that out. Melissa Smith, do Ian and Emily know about your lawyer crush? Mr. Whitney, Mr. Whitney, man, he cross-examines like I do. I thought it was Elaine Bredehoft. No, <laughs> no. Mr. Whitney. He Her mic is, work is just. Um... Like, there is, there is. He is direct. When when the witness goes sideways on him, when they, like he when the witness goes with the long-winded answer, he doesn't cut him off immediately. But when the witness finishes, he goes, thank you for that explanation. And then immediately starts going, I'm going to get you. And goes, boom, 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 boom. I was like, oh, yes, 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 yes. Love it. The thing I is, competence is such a fun thing to watch. It really I is. will give Elaine some props in the sense that uh, there's that moment where uh, Amber answers the question differently than what Elaine expects. Yep. And you see there's just like a slight pause before she goes again. She quick. She and that was quick. And I was like, the lawyers in the room are seeing this. Everyone else yes. in the room is missing this. And yep. that is exactly where you need to be. And I was like, that was smooth. But I caught it. <laughs> I absolutely and, caught it. She had that umbrage. Like, it was like, mm. yep. Hunter has <laughs> a moment in this trial where a witness catches him off guard. And it's a long pause. It's obvious to everybody. And I that made me appreciate that moment from Elaine. It's like, and, Wow. A few people caught that, but not a lot. No, she, were, she moved forward very quickly. Um, yeah. And sometimes there is a point where you want to where you want to make the long pause. Like you ask a witness something and they, they answer and you're like, huh, okay, because you said this in this other place and you want to communicate to the jury. <laughs> That's interesting. That was not the right answer. <laughs> like... Without what? actually texting to your bailiff going, can I just scream liar, liar, liar? No. <laughs> you can't do that. All right, I just heard that on Thursday. It ended up Jesus being a covered by game. Ian, me, and Emily, <laughs> and we all had a group chat about it, laughing hysterically over what the hell was happening. I could not. I could not. Yep. But I I appreciate that good lawyers bring us together and lawyers that are entertaining also bring us all together. Like we need we need both. I need to replace Correct. this chair. Maybe I should replace it with a pink one. <laughs> Only if you're going to make a calendar out of photos in it with your dog, think, that would be hilarious. That is the weirdest fetish, though, like that she wanted all of these lawyers in this pink chair. I'm like, we're going to bypass is that. Fetish or is it Ian? just straight up? I, 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 both of you. 
Both of you. <laughs> Kowalski trial, not fetish lawyers. Power move. I think it's a power <laughs> move, though. I'm just saying. I don't it's think it's... It's a power move. <laughs> it's Fair. also a power move That's... for me to redirect and put us on back on Kowalski. It's fine. November 4th, <laughs> Extra Life, we'll talk about the... Uh... <laughs> Yep. He's trying to keep us on task and shit. I am. I am. Because we're not going, we're not talking about a lawyer. We're not talking about a judge doing mis misbehaving. We're talking about a case that we need to keep in mind. This case. With a competent judge. I know. I get it. Let's I know. Uh, Alice Ham. When I was five and my parents were having a contentious divorce, I had chest pain and headaches. After many tests, nothing was wrong. It was from stress. Per J Hatch, I guess I was a malingering liar with Munchausen's by proxy. This is oh. what I'm saying. There's a lot of people that are, that are, this trial is triggering. Really touching. Yeah. Uh, Nisi, how much did Jay Hatch offer to settle? We won't know that. We can't know that. It's not proper for us to know that. Not enough. They'll never tell us. Yep. Not yeah, enough. not Nisi enough. They didn't bring uh, enough zeros. They didn't. EDB and Runkle of Bailey, opinions on paying for brain scans. This was, I think... Are we talking about medically or like recreationally? Casey Lewis, uh, I don't know what you're referencing here. I, I mean, I'm not I wish I did. I think this is billing codes, but I, I'm sorry. I have done neurological brain scans for neurofeedback stuff just because I'm into all of the things. And so with the ADHD, neurofeedback can be really helpful. Um, but that is out of pocket payment, though I think okay. it's well sorted science and should be covered but for some reason the insurance companies in the u.s lean towards pharmacological treatments and not other forms of treatment i don't know why that is kbl i'm going to address this because this has been brought up a lot suggestion read the dependency court transcript to on your channel so your chat can understand what everyone was doing and why the answer to that question and suggestion is no. It's no. Is the this dependency is not, not sealed? This is, it is sealed. Well, it's been unsealed since because the civil this. discovery stuff. Yeah. No. This is not the dependency action. It's not. Also, what everybody's doing and why should be explained in this trial if the lawyers are doing Correct. their jobs. Exactly, because there is a wall, there is a line that is a fine line, a very fine line, and that is Chapter 39 immunity. Um, Hunter, Attorney Hunter gave an expression, and I have stopped using it because I did see that it could be offensive, but he said, that question has more landmines in it than the beaches at Normandy. And I was like, well, that's an interesting question, suggestion or response. It was offensive to others, but I also kind of understood the point. This trial is watching is walking a tightrope. Chapter 39 immunity is there. It's there. The investigation is behind this wall that we're not allowed to see. The jury is not allowed to see. The chat is not allowed to see. Yeah. This is about liability. I try to explain that in the civil context. And I try to explain that the dependency action and hospitals' actions in conformity and in compliance with those orders are immune. But I'm not going to read that transcript. That is out of this case. It's not in this case. It's not a part of this case. It's different. And I know you have an opinion. I know a lot of people do. But I have to walk that line. Zoe, got my dream paralegal internship inspired by y'all. Thank you, Zoe. That's very Yay, good. Nice. Awesome. I'm glad for you. Spencer in Michigan, thank you for the very, very generous super chat. Much appreciated. RK here late. Did Emily D. Baker watch any of the jury questions? She did. She enjoyed it. She laughed. Uh, Haley P. Uh, Hallie P. I own an ice cream shop. We used to uh, old smoky whiskey in our ice cream. Where um, is this shop? I need all <laughs> of this to happen in my mouth. Like, where is this? I just knew that was going to be said by both of them. I love all three of you. I never catch lives tonight. Makes me so happy. We're glad to have you here. Calypsons Dixon. Extra judicial, extra judicial, extra judicial, extra judicial. 
But seriously, that where is that, that shot? That last one was sketch, <laughs> but that was that's in Michigan. What is the Fabre's thing we keep hearing every now and then? So a Fabre witness uh, or a Fabre uh, defense is essentially saying that there's an invisible person who's not in the courtroom who shares liability with the defendant. So you should not give the defendant all of the blame in this particular case. You should bifurcate the blame between two people, one who's not in court, one who is in court. That's a Fabre defense. You want to do that? It's basically a defendant passing blame off on another person who's not there. In criminal law, we call that the empty chair defense or some other dude did it. Sod it. That person. Yeah, sod it. Or it wasn't me, the shaggy defense. One of the three. Yeah, the shaggy. I mean, sometimes uh, it's a specific per specific other dude did it. Um, yep. But there's ethical rules around that too, which gets difficult. It's true. Yeah. Lindsay, you win the internet tonight. Waiting for the announcement about Wood Daddy Wine by Beaver Moon Brewers. Because because Beaver Moon started with me and Judge Abby because Judge Abby's election, like election night was literally a beaver full moon. And we had like a full coven of lawyers out in the desert for the full moon for election night for Judge Abby when she won. And so I was joking that I wanted Beaver Moon whiskey. And then the internet made logos for Beaver Moon liquor. Because, oh God, I don't want to know what those logos look like. They, no, they were actually, really, they were really great and, and fun and not obscene. And so Beaver Moon <laughs> liquor became this like, won't this be fun? So there were, there were no stacks involved is what you're saying. No, but there could be. <laughs> so that was, that was the, the delight of the Beaver Moon. Yeah. Uh, SF, I wish you guys had more time to do this more often. Shoot the breeze about whatever. Me too. Me too. Extra judicial question mark. Congrats on 200 K Ian. Can you do me a favor? Do you have your keyboard up? I I've got a keyboard in front of me. Can you pull up two or three of these chats? I need a break for one oh, second. Sure. All right. So made some questionable decisions drinking old smoky. Um, me too. I forget which, um, which moonshine brand it was that came in a jar, but we, um, at a bunch of us, used to have gatherings where we would call it the jar of bad decisions and we'd pass it around and um, some bad decisions were made. It was good times. I don't remember what game it was that we played in college because ADHD and memory is a thing, but everybody at the table would be drinking. And then if you won, like something would go into a pitcher in the middle, but if you lost, then you had to drink the pitcher in the middle. Ooh. Oh, that sounds like a recipe for like disaster. a hospital. Disaster. <laughs> disaster. Disgusting and disaster. Well, the game, was, were kings. The game was kings. Is that the game? Thank you. It was terrible. It was a bad decision for everybody involved. I don't have, I mean, my my memory. Maybe so because I'm drinking the you left, yeah. the table. You left okay. two ADHD people in charge and we got through one super chat while you were gone. <laughs> you were gone very fast. Uh, take back the left. Uh, thank you for the super chat. KBL 403 plaintiff is still arguing against FDIA. FDIA. I didn't know what it was called. Thanks, chat. FDIA. Are you saying IIED? FDIA. Fastidious disorder. Formerly syndrome by proxy disorder. I googled. Factitious disorder. Um, you're allowed to argue against that, just like the hospital is allowed to produce evidence in support of a contention that she did have it. But that evidence cannot go to the spiking the football level of the ketamine infusion, etc. Yeah, they don't usually like you to. There's a certain point where the court will just be like, you've made your point. You've, you've won made this your issue. Point. Move you, you, on. You cannot go further than that. Yeah. yeah. They they draw a line. Golden Hermit, how do you convince someone that it is stubborn and heartbroken to have a lawyer help them through a divorce? How do you convince someone that it's stubborn and heartbroken to have a lawyer help them through a divorce? I have a friend that wants to just sign papers and they don't understand to get it over with. Have you tried yelling? No, That's don't do that. <laughs> I'm don't not being that. serious. Um, offer to help um, them find. Offer to help them find the attorney, and often to offer to help hold their hand 
through yes. it. Sometimes yes. it's overwhelming to do this and yes. say, let me help you find an attorney and we can take the papers together. That doesn't Correct. Mean, and I will go hard. with you. Yeah. I will go with you. I won't go in. I will go with you. I'll drop you off. I'll, I'll do all those things. And the other thing is find the right attorney. Finding the right divorce attorney is different. So you can get a feel from different attorneys based on how their staff treats you, et cetera. So you can feel you that out. You want somebody so, that's going to be compassionate. Yes. Yep. Especially and, with a case like this. And someone who's going to understand the goal is to understand and then maybe point out options that might not be taken. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, too. That's usually my wheelhouse. Thank you. My brain had to shift for a second and you guys were on top of it. It's a hard, it's a hard thing, um, which sometimes does devolve into yelling because you care about your friends, but they're not in the place to make those decisions. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, people get overwhelmed and they're depressed. They're sad. They don't like thinking about it. Take better left. Not a fan of having Rob's friends on for banter and levity. That's a fair, fair assessment. Enough. They can take the criticism. I prefer the dry analytical commentary. You'll get that next week. It's Friday. Rob just hit 200 K. I so. did. I did. I can have a little bit. I have had two brain scans. Luckily, they didn't find anything. That's Hopefully, they lucky. found a little something. <laughs> they did. Oh, God, I just got that. Okay. <laughs> Carla Vieira, do lawyers ever regret representing clients? Every time sometimes. they don't pay. Sometimes. <laughs> but realistically, sometimes. Yeah. Um, In reality, or sometimes. when they discover soft stuff midway through your representation. Yep. That's like, okay. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right. Speed around because I'm sick. Uh, Melissa Smith is refurbishing my scullery with cinnamon aluminum linoleum to uh, piquant or just acceptable susceptibility. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> I, think I did okay on that. I think it's acceptable. Yes. Uh, for Ian's Pink Chair Fund. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> Not that, Mickey. Thank you for the very generous super chat. Love your stream. Has been hijacked. We all needed this fun live. It's Thank fine. Thank you for being here. That's very kind of you and very generous. Catherine Clark, EDB, and Runkle of the Bailey brain scan plus a $4 investigation, DCF versus insurance. Oh, wait. Brain scan money for investigation, DCF versus insurance. Okay. I get it. Um, that's a more complicated answer than I think anyone can really give because there's a lot of context and a lot of speculation that we would have to put into that. And I don't think that anyone on the screen is comfortable doing that level of speculation. MAE nerd. Maya wasn't the only victim. I think this trial is more about the truth coming out than the money. So many public stories. So who knows the true number? Yeah, because at the end of the day, no number can fix it. You can't. But I wonder up. how healing it is at some point to have a, because with a hospital, you know, the calculation is how much is insurance going to pay and how much can we pay to make this go away? I think they want a jury to tell the hospital that they're wrong. Like yeah. you need to be told that you're wrong because no amount of money is going to make it right. So what you need is to be told that you're wrong, not just to acquiesce yeah. on a cost benefit analysis. Correct. Uh, Spencer, Michigan, any idea when closing arguments are expected to take place? The defense is anticipating resting on either Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Tuesday is Halloween. The judge has said that he will be recessing the court early because one of the jurors has to be out and back at her house for trick-or-treating at 5.15. I, mean, very and I, he I love is that. Not, well, he is not yet sure what his wife is going to instruct him of as far as his obligations. He has said that vocally. It has been very comical when he has. But I love Tuesday that the judge is respects Halloween. Day. Well, Tuesday's a shorter day. Wednesday, the defense should be absolutely rested by that date. But then Thursday and Friday are off. There are no court days on Thursday and Friday. So they will come back on uh, November the... November the 6th for deliberations, I believe. And then we'll get into it. But I think there's the judge is planning for three days of deliberation total. So uh and c thank you hey the pete parker's ice cream in san antonio ish and there is an ice cream convention in vegas next week i can bring some to you ED. oh how many, let me know what day you're going to be in vegas i get there on wednesday and then i i move in i stay too long so i'll be yep. there 
And I uh, might M-A-E be in San Antonio N- later, so I'm writing this down. Hang on. I, I just I passed. might hang on. Where was it? I might end up showing up. It was this Parker's ice cream. Parker's ice cream in San Amazing. Antonio. Amazing. Thank you, Hallie. Yep. An ice cream convention in Vegas. There's um, a house ice convention too. I love that those yep. things are happening at the same time. Hopefully there's not also a strike. MAE nerd. I mean, Smith's been doing this for more families. Yes. I, I think there's other people who are protesting this as well. Billy's Momzilla. Thank you. ADK EMT for Rob's pink chair fund. I will just take that and pocket that. That Thank you for that. Okay. So Fair I'm going to wrap this real quick. Oh, guys, the late super chats. Fiona, thank you very, very much. I love the late super chats. They are fantastic. Thanks <laughs> all. Sick today, but you made me feel better. Me too. And this made me feel better as well. Um, you know what I say about people feeling better and how you make that happen? Go make something you will feel better. Please go check out my guest, Emily D. Baker. If you haven't subscribed to her, who the hell are you? Uh, <laughs> Uncle of the Bailey. Please check them out. They are phenomenal friends. They are great friends and they've been supportive of this channel and me and my content the whole time. Please check them out and review their content like subscribe do all the things that you love to do carlo Vieira can ss or cv get criminally charged after trial sol statute of limitations is likely passed on anything that would stick misdemeanor charges maybe felony but five ten years i think we're past that five ten years is tough on a lot of things in criminal yeah azam yeah. thank you for the super sticker okay guys i gotta get running thank you for being here thank you to my oh, guests God, love all God, of you sick. you need to recover you need to I go do. need a, a, a bath. You need to limp to a soup <laughs> and a bath. I have to do all of those things. I have to do all of those things. Every one of those things. Congratulations on 200K, Rob. I, that is huge. It's it's a huge, exciting accomplishment. What color are you dyeing your beard? Purple. What? I'm just, there's got to be something that's happening to commemorate 200k or I no I, I, I said that or I said that uh, I read ju- I, judicial I chair pink. Back. i gave a promise a while back that i would read i was hired by a solo practitioner and i was in court the first week after i was hired that solo practitioner has since been disbarred <laughs> you've got I a dire beard judicial chair pink I had a lot of trial experience very early on because of that. And I was, I was uh, kind of trial by fire in litigation. And I, I kind of promised the chat that I might read the disbarment of that prior attorney. Oh no, I think that has to happen. If you told the chat that was going to happen. I think that has, I think that has to happen. It takes a lot for people to be disbarred as we've seen with disbarment. Oklahoma judge who will probably still have their license to practice law. Once they are yeeted from the bench, they will be swiftly yeeted from the bench, but they will I still have their law license for case now. To dis- I think there's a real case to disbar Oklahoma judge. I agree with you, Ian. So Lying to the tribunal is, is right. Is Disbarable. sufficient to disbar them. I believe I just haven't seen those proceedings starting yet. Let me give you the punch. One of the punchlines. The trust account had a debit card that he used to buy liquor in Miami. Wait, off the trust account? The trust account had a debit card? I mean, at least Tom Girardi tried to launder the trust account when he was stealing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do not fuck with client but, funds. But don't worry. Don't worry. He told the bar commission that it, it had overdraft protection. <laughs> if you overdraft the trust account? I... like. I told you. (laughs) You had to be there. It was Miami. It was lit. I had exceeded my credit card balances and there's like all this money sitting there, whatever. And I'll repay it totally. But there's overdraft protection. Like no one's going to be hurt. On the trust account. That's awful. That is the worst. So Um, I felt like that was the appropriate 200,000 milestone reading. Speaking well, of sound point. financial decisions, um, I am doing a fundraiser for Extra Life that I should yes, also pitch. Uh, November 4th, I'm going to be doing 24-hour live stream. I am going to be the tired runkle the whole time. Uh, wait, because- wait, wait, wait. There's rewards in this one, right? 
there's like this got real competitive last year remind me what the award tiers are because we oh. were pushing to award bump you last year well last year we got into this place where there was a bunch of different because we actually got onto the top 10 yeah and then once we were on the top 10 there was a bunch of corporations like gaming companies that were pouring money into their own fundraiser donations so that they could make sure that they were on the top 10 so we were getting to this weird place where like every donation was getting matched like five times because these other companies would pay money to uh to surpass it um so that was fun there's that also cool. this year uh because we raised fifty thousand last year uh the stollery has noted that if they um if if there's a hundred thousand of lifetime things they will put up a plaque so selfishly i would like to put up a plaque at the uh the hospital to I be agree. like hey. yes. and i'm donating um, five pens to be auctioned so Yes. Um, should we? We should auction those one at a time. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like not yeah. a set. One at a time. Yeah. 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 So um, I have to go through a bunch of people have emailed me saying that they want to auction or to donate stuff as well. So I got to go through all of that. Um, I got to figure out if I can. I have been behind on my leather work because life has been crazy. Um, but I've got a partially finished journal that I will finish and send out. Um. All sorts of things. Uh, Chris M96 has noted and a robot. So if you see the jury in the background, um, one of those will be up for auction. Uh, a custom robot of, you know, I guess within reason of whatever, uh, whatever you'd like. Appropriately minded request. Yes. Um, we are not doing anything that would like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing that would show up in like a court filing, please. Correct. <laughs> just put so, these things though. Uh, the final tally for the evening. Thank you, Celine, for for bringing us out this evening. Uh, the microphone glitches zero, bugs five, computer one, f bombs one, mods fifty plus twelve. Uh, BP pause. Oh, you have f bombs now. BP pause four, spinning <laughs> wheel two, squirrel one hundred and forty two. Swoop seven, Rob thirty plus five, uh, EDB Runkle multiplier two times. So that's the math, that's the scoring, that's how Celine scores it, that's how the stream is rated. And without further ado, thank you to my lovely guests. I wish you all a wonderful, pleasant evening. I will be back live tomorrow at 6 p.m. with Spidey from the Behavioral Arts discussing. Sally Smith and the depots versus the live testimony. Which one do we believe? Which That'd one be was the lie? Because there is no way of viewing them in the same realm of truth or lie. So, I mean, they could further both ado, be lies. They could be. They could be. Um, enjoy your evenings. Have a pleasant weekend uh, and go make something. I promise you guys you'll feel better. <laughs>